وَإِن تَعْجَبْ فَعْجَبٌ قَوْلُهُمْ أَيْذَا كُنَّا تُرَابًا أَيْنَّا لَفِي خَلْقٍ جَدِيدٍ أُولَئِكَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بِرَبِّهِمْ وَأُولَئِكَ الْأَغْلَالُ فِي أَعْنَاقِهِمْ وَأُولَئِكَ أَصْحَابُ النَّارِ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أستاذ محمد همبو السلام عليكم رحمة الله وبركاته وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته How are you doing today? Very well, Jazakallah khairan, how are you? Well, Jazakallah khairan, I'm good too, mashallah Barakallah fiq once again for joining me on the Hot Seat Podcast Wa fiqa barakallah Not your first time of course and I like to remind anybody who's kind of coming across our podcast in the last few months that this is something that we started in 2019 and we've had about 20 to 21 episodes so far. You've been on it numerous times. So if anybody does want to see those episodes, they can refer to our channel and have a look at the playlist section where they should see the Hot Seat podcast. Having said that, this is probably one of the most requested episodes. I think frequently when I go through the comment section, a lot of people are asking for the topic of feminism. And that's because it's so relevant, particularly for Muslims in the West. In the last couple of decades, perhaps, there's been a real push to have gender neutrality, gender equality. And a lot of sincere Muslims, whether they be brothers or sisters, they really have the question on their mind, is Islam a misogynistic religion? Does it oppress women? How does Islam deal with the issue of men and women being equal? And that's kind of the questions and the questions that I want to be answering today, um, as I often do, I'm going to give you a 10 minute introduction to lay down some principles and some foundations before we go into the discussion in a little bit more detail, inshallah. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen والصلاه والسلام على عبد الله ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين It is a very very important topic and it is a topic that a lot of people are asking about and I think it would be beneficial to lay down some principles that will help us to frame our discussion and maybe things we can come back to time and time again So the very first principle that I want to share with everyone is that Islam is a religion of justice not necessarily a religion of equality in everything. Give you a couple of examples of that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Inna Allah ya'muru bil adli wal ihsani wa ita'i dhul qurba. Allah commands justice and doing good to others and giving to your relatives. So Allah Azza wa Jal commanded justice, mm. but nowhere in the Quran did Allah command equality. Okay. Rather, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in several places in the Quran criticizes people who make things equal that are not equal. For example, Allah Azza wa Jal said, أَفَنَجْعَلُ الْمُسْلِمِينَ كَالْمُجْرِمِينَ مَا لَكُمْ كَيْفَ تَحْكُمُونَ Did we make or shall we make Muslims like criminals? What is the matter with you? How you judge? And many ayat, Allah talked about how the heat is not equal to the shade and how the one who can see is not equal to the one who is blind and so on. So Islam is not a religion that commands equality necessarily, but it's a religion that commands justice. Okay. The second principle that I would like to lay down is the basic concept in Islam that men and women are different and that there isn't a virtue in men and women being the same. And for that, of course, we can quote the ayah in which Allah Azza wa Jal tells us about the wife of Imran, the mother of Maryam alayha as-salam, when she said, Rabbi inni wada'atuha untha, wallahu a'lamu bima wada'at wa laysa dhakaru kal untha. Oh my Lord, I've given birth to a girl, and Allah knew better who she had given birth to. And the male is not like mm -hmm. the female. It's interesting, and I think probably not so much to cover too much now, but just to touch upon the idea of Maryam, how her mother envisaged she would have a boy and envisaged all the things that boy would do. And yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave her better than what she envisaged by giving her, by giving her a girl. Mm. And I think that's a beautiful, you know, something to come back to just to remember that story of Maryam. But to take from it the principle that men and women are fundamentally different. Okay. I think it's really important to highlight that neither men nor women have a choice when it comes to the Sharia of Islam. And that is something in which men and women are equal. 
Allah Azza wa Jalla clearly said, "وما كان لمؤمن ولا مؤمنة إذا قضى الله ورسوله أمر أن يكون لهم الخيرة من أمرهم ومن يعصي الله ورسوله فقد ضل ضلالا بعيدا فقد ضل ضلالا مبينا." It's not for a believing man, nor is it for a believing woman, if Allah and His Messenger decree something that they should have any choice in the matter. Now here, look at how Allah Azza wa Jalla said, the believing man, the believing woman. Mm. It's not for the believing man, it's not for the believing woman. Neither a man nor a woman has a right to have a choice after the Sharia was revealed on a particular matter, after it's clear what Allah revealed on something and what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam judged on a matter, Muslim men and Muslim women are equal in not having a choice and in being required to submit. Okay. The fourth principle that I would like to talk about is that Islam isn't a woman submitting to a man. It's about men and women submitting to Allah And in this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us, Ya ayyuhal nas, inna khalaqnakum min dhakarin wa untha. وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلًا لِتَعَرَفُوا إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلِيمٌ خَبِيرٌ O mankind, we have created you male and female, and we have made you into nations and tribes, so that you may know one another. The one who is the most noble in the sight of Allah is the one who is, has the most taqwa, and Allah is all-knowing and all-aware. And there is a beautiful story from the story of Hajar. When... Ibrahim alayhi salam, he left Hajar in Mecca without anything, in a barren valley. And she said to him something which I believe could be a principle for us as we move forward. She said, Allahu alladhi amaraka bihada. She said, was it Allah that commanded you to leave me here? Qala na'am, qalat idhan la yudayyuna. He said, yes. She said, then he's not going to cause us to be lost. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Inni o anni la udi'u amala amilin minkum min thakarin aw untha ba'dukum min ba'd. I will not cause any deeds to be lost, male or female, whether you are a man or a woman. I will not cause any of your deeds to be lost. You are from each other. You are, uh, the, the, you are what, from one another. And I will not cause your deeds to be lost, whether you are male or female. I think it's really important that we don't seek to gain something that someone else has been given by Allah, nor do we waste our time coveting something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to someone else. Right. Allah Azza wa Jalla said, Wala tatamanna ma fadla Allahu bihi ba'dakum ala ba'd, lil rijali nasibun min maktasabu, wa lil nisa'i nasibun min maktasabun, wasalu Allah min fadlih, inna Allah kana bi kulli shayna alima. Do not seek what Allah has preferred some of you with over others, men will have a share of what they have earned and women will have a share of what they have earned and ask Allah from his bounty. Allah is always knowing of everything. It's also important to establish the Sharia is not here to talk about every individual case. There is a beautiful principle from the Qawaid, which are Qawaid Faqiyah, the Qawaid of Fiqh, which says that Al-Ibratu lil la lin nadir, that the attention is given or consideration is given to what is the majority and mm. what is commonplace, not what is rare and the odd exception to the rule. Okay. The basic principle in rulings is that rulings apply to men and women together because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Inna nisa'a shaqa'iqu rijal He said that women are the full sisters of men, meaning that if the Quran brings a ruling, that ruling is for men and women unless you have a clear reason for it to be for men only okay. or for women mm. only. We also want to clarify that an individual woman can be way better than an individual man. That's very important because a lot of times people are, have this idea that when we're talking about men and women, that we're talking about all men and all women. But in reality, there, is, there are evidences which are undeniable that there will be many women who are above many men in Jannah, just to give the example of Maryam, of Asiya, the wife of Fir'aun, of uh, Fatima, of Aisha, of the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or Allahu Anhun, the Sahabiyat, there is no doubt that there will be many, many women who have precedence in the sight of Allah over many, many men. We're talking about rulings here, not talking about individual women and individual, individual men. 
And I think that ultimately we can conclude by saying that Islam is a religion of wisdom, hikmatun baligha, and that Allah doesn't oppress anyone. Wala yadhlimu rabbuka ahada. Your Lord does not oppress anybody at all. I think with that we can we can make a good start, inshallah, on on the topic. Okay, inshallah. That's the f- I think that's the first time we've actually gone within time. You still got an hour and fifty. Uh, sorry, one minute and fifty seconds left. Okay. So let me stop the timer there, inshallah. Okay, I think that was really important, and I think you laid down some really good principles that I'm sure we're going to refer to back to as we continue the discussion. Just to summarize some of them, I won't catch all of them, but just some of them. Um, you mentioned that Islam is not a religion that necessarily dictates equality, rather it commands justice. And there is a difference between the two. Just explain for the viewers what you mean by that kind of difference between justice and equality. So equality is where two things are made to be the same. Hmm. They're made to be equal. And justice is what the scholars define the word justice as, is putting something in its proper place. So to put something in its proper place may be to put something lower than something else Mm -hmm. or to give something more than something else. But that would be done in a way that is just, not in a way that necessarily means that one for one and one for the other. Yeah, yeah. I think the example that I often come across is in the dunya, for example, which nobody would would deny, is the food that an adult eats is not the same food that a child eats. And it would be equal to give them the same food, but it would also be very dangerous and very harmful. So I think I don't think that's really a concept that anybody can really dispute, particularly when we apply it in, in matters like that. The second thing that you mentioned was that, um, or one of the things that you mentioned was that both men and women, when it comes to the rulings in Islam, they have been uh, it's their obligation to submit to them. If it comes from Allah and His Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, whether you're a man, whether you're a woman, you have no choice but to submit to it. And of course, that's from the the root word of Islam as well, submission. Um, and the final thing you mentioned is that it's not right for any gender to want what the other gender has been given by, of course, Allah and His Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And of course, that doesn't apply just for genders; it applies. Throughout the dunya, throughout the you know, throughout the world, people are given more wealth than others, and it's just a, you know, it's not, it's not going to be very time efficient to really just wish that you had this kind of wealth that you, you know you've been given something less than exactly. that. Exactly, make use of what you have been yeah. what you have been given rather than wishing to be somebody else. Okay, let's go into some of the more specific questions. And I know you mentioned, and this is something that you have an opportunity to expand on the the issue of inequality, because a lot of women really do feel that men have been given this superior status above and over them in the religion of Islam. And this is something that they admit, this is from Allah and His Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but they do question why. And it does often, it, it makes them feel like life is difficult for them. And of course, there's a, there's a couple of ayat in the Quran, Ar-Rijalu qawamuna ala nisa and another one, وَلِلْرِجَالِ عَلَيْهِنَّ دَرَجَةٌ وَاللَّهُ عَزِيزٌ حَكِيمٌ Both of these ayat indicate that men are superior to women, that they've been given a degree of authority over women. How would you explain that for someone who might be struggling to understand that? Mm-hmm. So there's no doubt that Allah Azawajal said, الرِّجَالُ قَوَّمُونَ عَلَى النِّسَاء بِمَا فَضَّلَ اللَّهُ بَعْضَهُمْ عَلَى بَعْضَ Men have a قَوَّامَ and the qawwama, what it really means is, it means an authority or a responsibility, uh, a responsibility to, to be in charge, something like that, over women by what Allah has given some of them over others. Mm-hmm. And what they spend out of their wealth. The first thing I think is really important is, when we talk about qawwama, we talk about the issue of authority. We talk about the man being the head of the household. It is really, really important to understand that authority in of itself can be as much of a trial as it is mm. something good. Okay. And for example, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Kullukum ala kullukum ra'in wa kullukum mas'oolun an ra'iyati. Every one of you is a shepherd and every one of you will be asked about their flock. Mm. So he mentioned in this, the man and the woman, he mentioned that the man is responsible for his family and he will be asked about it by Allah, what did you do with that family? The second thing is that the woman is also responsible. It's not that the woman has been given no qawama or no responsibility or authority at all. Actually, she has been given it over the children. She has been given it. And that's a really important point to bear in mind, this idea that male and female children both have a right of obedience towards their, towards their mother. 
But that's a responsibility in the sight of Allah Azza wa It's really important also to remember that when we talk about obedience, obedience is not absolute to any human being except for the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that's why Allah Azza wa said, Ya ayuhal ladheena aman wa ati'u Allah wa ati'u rasoola wa ulil amri minkum. All you who believe, obey Allah, absolutely. Obey the Messenger, absolutely. And those in authority over you. He didn't repeat the word obey mm. here, meaning that obedience to them is subject to it being obedience to Allah and his messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So what that gives the, the woman is, it gives her the right that her husband is not permitted to ask her to do something which is haram. Okay. He's not allowed. And if he asks her, she has no obligation. In fact, it would not be permissible for her to obey him at all. So she is only obeying him in that which is obedience to Allah and to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's also important to note that the ruler is not necessarily better than the one who is ruled over in what general. You mean by that? So for example, if we take, let's say the Imam of the Muslims, who is in charge of the Muslims, now he's in charge over everyone, male and female, right? We have to obey him because Allah told us to obey the one in charge. Generally, whether he's in charge of the family, in charge of the region, in charge of the country, in charge of yeah. all of the Muslims. Does that mean that him being in charge necessarily makes him better than the people he's in charge over? Or better is it as in more pious. Like, better in the sight of better Allah. Better in the sight of Allah. Mm. At all. There's not a single yeah. evidence to say that the ruler is better in the sight of Allah than the one who is ruled over. So that husband who has been given that qawama may not be better in the sight of Allah than that woman. And the clearest of evidences for this is Asiya, the wife of Fir'aun. Fir'aun who is from the worst of the worst and he, among the leaders that will take the people into Jahannam. Mm. And his wife, one of the people that the Prophet ﷺ said that she completed her iman. Her iman was complete. She completed her faith. Just because Fir'aun had authority of the head of the household of the husband over her it doesn't mean that he was better than her in fact we know for a fact he wasn't mm. so this idea of craving over uh, authority and the authority is better i believe it is not an islamic idea and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said to abu dhar actually he said to him in a hadith and the hadith is narrated by muslim he said ya abu dhar inni araka da'ifa وَإِنِّي أُحِبُّ لَكَ مَا أُحِبُّ لِنَفْسِي I see you to be weak and I love for you what I love for myself. So don't make yourself in charge of two people. Mm. And he said, I love you Abu Dhar. I love for you, I want for yourself. But I can see it's not good for you. It's not good for you to have that responsibility. So I don't want you to take responsibility over even two people. The hadith is narrated by Muslim. Apply that now that Allah has chosen the man of the household to be responsible for the woman. And he's given him, given that man a degree of authority over her within what is permissible in Islam and within what is pleasing to Allah uh, Azza wa Jal. Allah Azza wa Jal knows us. Doesn't the one who created know? He knows us. He knows what's good for us. He knows what's going to bring good for us or not. The Prophet came to Abu Dhar, who's a man. And he said to him, Abu Dhar, I love you, for, I love for you what I love for myself. Don't be in charge of two people. So shouldn't we not take as a, as a woman, Muslim woman, should she not then accept that Allah Azza wa Jal has chosen that for her, mm. that he knows her and he and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, loved for the Muslims what he loved for himself. So don't, you know, don't take that responsibility. Again, remember what we said in the beginning in terms of principles, that the Sharia looks at the Al-Ghalib, al shari it looks at that which is commonplace and normal. Yeah. It doesn't look at the fact that there might be situations in which there is a woman who would be far better to be responsible for her husband. It looks at the majority of yeah. situations. Add to that even, that is it a requirement that the man should use that authority at all times? In reality, not really. The man is more than welcome to consult with his wife, ask his wife, take her opinion, prefer her opinion, give her responsibility for something within the family. At the end of the day, it's about organizing the society. It's not necessarily about uh, him having complete control. And even in this, let's give an example that this authority doesn't extend to everything. Let's look at the spending of the woman. Jumhur mm al-ulama, -hmm. the majority of the scholars of Islam, they held that the man has no right to dictate to his wife what she does with her money. Okay. So it's not again, even an absolute authority. In, in everything, yeah, and yeah, there true, are exceptions yeah. to it. So I think when we look at all of these things together, 
we see it isn't it isn't easy i mean it's not easy for a, for a woman to necessarily you know fit into that and say to herself that she's going to be you know respect her husband's authority and respect him as the head of the household but allah which has organized our society it's obedience to allah not obedience to a man and yeah. that's ultimately what the argument is isn't it it's about women being subservient to men mm -hmm. but here it's about obedience to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not about a man to a woman and it's about organizing the society there are many exceptions and many cases like we mentioned for example the male child towards his mother that's an an example of uh, a man a being a woman and the obedience there is of a very high degree Look at the prophet mm -hmm. says three times ummuk your mother your mother your mother many of the scholars they took this to mean obedience that a woman has a mother has three times the right of obedience over over the father so i think this is what we talked about it's fairness it's justice it works in the society uh, rather than it being necessarily the same yeah i think this issue of authority is going to be something that we're going to come back to i really want to go into the the example of husband and wife more specifically later okay. on in the podcast but there's no doubt it's an underlying principle that a lot of people have an issue with what if someone said to you that the way that allah has designed this it might not be intended to oppress women but there's no doubt that many men can and they do take advantage of this authority and therefore it results in oppressing women. Why couldn't it just be equal partners? You're both married together, living together, raising children together. Why couldn't it just be an equal partnership? So there's no doubt that there are many cases in which people oppress other people, not just men or husbands oppressing their women, but there are many cases in which people generally oppress other people because of their authority and their, their power. I think there are a couple of things uh, to bear in mind. Number one, this oppression typically happens when people distance themselves from Islam. The more the husband is in line with Islam and what Islam commands him to do, the more likely it is that he's going to treat his wife in the best possible way. Isn't this this particular example exactly in line with Islam? Because Islam is actually saying, men, you have a right over women. Whereas if Islam said you both are equal parties, we wouldn't really have but this But here issue. we're not talking about, we're talking about, you specifically mentioned oppression. Your Lord doesn't oppress anyone. Mm. So there's no, I'm talking about a man oppressing his wife. He cannot be in line with Islam mm. if he's oppressing his wife because there is no oppression in Islam. Okay. He has to be, he has to have gone outside of Islam. And that's why it was said in the, in the early days that, you know, when it comes to marrying your daughter to somebody that you should look for a person of religion because however he feels about that woman, he's going to treat her well. Mm -hmm. The Prophet said, Treat your women to the, the highest standard. So that is what you would, you would see from a man who is uh, practicing Islam properly. That's my first point. Okay. My second point on this topic is that even the society as a whole, there are checks and balances, or there should be checks and balances within that society. So many, many times you see, and there are examples I'm sure we're going to come to, in terms of uh, husband and wife relationships and things like that, where the female companions went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they complained, the men are doing this, tell the men to do this, I've come because my husband is like this. Simple example. قَدْ سَمِعَ اللَّهُ قَوْلَ الَّتِي تُجَادِلُكَ فِي زَوْجِهَا وَتَشْتَكِي إِلَى اللَّهِ Allah has certainly heard the statement of the woman who came to complain about her husband. That's part of the checks and balances that she goes to the, the person who is in the position of rulership or the qadi, the one who is the judge and says, my husband is not treating me properly. And that's supposed to be dealt with. That's uh, an, another point. And the third thing is that many times oppression takes place in this world across the board in many different ways. And a person is rewarded for it in the hereafter. Mm. Because ultimately this is an issue of qadr, right? Yeah. That there are issues of oppression happen all over the world. People are being oppressed in many different regards. And ultimately, Allah Azza wa Jal might raise a person Yawm al Qiyamah because of some oppression that they suffer or some hardship that they go through. It's not because Allah loves that, but because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to raise that person through it. Having said that, it's our job as Muslims to stand against all kinds of oppression. Like the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on Surah Khaka, Zaliman aw madhruma, help your brother whether he's an oppressor or oppressed. He said, if he's oppressed, we we know how to help him. But how shall we help him if he is a zalim, if he's an oppressor? The Prophet told him to stop him, stop him from his oppression. Stop that person from doing that oppression. 
So it's our job to actually correct the situation. And there are many times in Islam where if the rules of Islam are not followed, then no doubt it leads to oppression mm. and it leads to people having their rights taken away. And that's not the fault of the religion of Islam, but that's the fault of the way people practice it. Okay. One thing that obviously you mentioned in your introduction as, as a golden principle is that when it comes to attaining reward in the hereafter, men and women are equal in that. And they both have an equal chance of attaining the hereafter, which of course is the main goal, at least it should be the main goal for Muslims. Having said that, there is a hadith that I'd like to ask you about and quiz you on because how can you claim that if we have a clear-cut hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari where the Prophet وسلم, said, O oh, women, give sadaqah as I have seen that the majority of the dwellers of hellfire are you women. Doesn't this clearly prove that actually there's not even an equal chance in the akhirah because that most women are actually going to end up in the hellfire? Mm. This is a very important hadith you mentioned. Very important hadith. Uh, the hadith, as you mentioned, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, يَمَعْشَ النِّسَاتَ صَدَّقْنَا وَأَكْثِرْنَا الْإِسْتِغْفَارِ فَإِنِّي رَأَيْتُ كُنَّ أَكْثَرَ أَهْلِ النَّارِ said all women give charity and make a lot of istighfar, seek a lot of forgiveness. For I have seen that women are the majority of the people of the fire. I think the first question we have to ask here, the hadith is a long hadith, we'll come back to it, but there are, there are the first thing we have to ask is, is the reason that she is in the fire because she's a woman? Mm. That's not the case. In fact, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned specifically the reasons why that person is taken to the fire. Mm. For example, if I were to say to you uh, that the majority of the people of the fire are, I don't know, uh, from, are from a particular country, for example, the fact that they're from that, that's not, that's a factual matter right. as to the, the composition of the people of the fire. But it doesn't mean that that was the reason. It, being a woman is not the reason she's from the people of the fire. Otherwise, that would apply to all women, right? I'm it with would be you. just I'm with that you. she's a woman, she goes to the fire. It's like saying the majority of the people of the fire are people who had two arms in the... Yeah. It doesn't. It doesn't mean that just because they have two arms, they end up in the yeah, fire. It's, it's just. It's just. A, it's just a characteristic that they have. It's just description. But there's a reason for it. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam also he didn't specify that this relates to the Muslims either. He didn't specify particularly, but he mentioned certain things. So he mentioned takfur al ashir. You reject the good that your husband has done. Now we actually have a hadith in which the Prophet sallam explains this in detail. He said, He said, perhaps one of you would spend a long time unmarried with her parents. Mm. And then he said, And she would become really, you know, like a, a, a woman who struggled to get married. She can't get married. Then Allah gives her a husband. Allah blesses her with a husband. And Allah gives her wealth from that husband. The husband spends on her. And a child or children. She just becomes angry one day. I never saw any good from him ever. So he said this could be a reason why a woman becomes from the people of the fire. That she got all of these blessings from Allah. Mm. And Allah gave her a husband. After a long time, she couldn't get married. Allah gave her a husband. Allah gave her money. Allah gave her children. And then she gets angry one day and she says, I never saw anything good from you. That's not just disrespectful to the husband who did that good for her, but it's disrespectful to Allah Azza wa Jal who gave her those things. Right. I've never seen anything good. Now here, what's the job of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi was sent Bashiran wa Nadira to bring glad tidings and to warn people. He warned the men about certain things. For example, he said, uh, he said in a hadith, these two people are being punished and they're not being punished for something which people think is major. And he mentioned one of them didn't keep themselves clean when they went to the toilet and the other one used to spread gossip among the people. Many times the Prophet warned, this, these people will be in the fire. This person will be in the fire. He's warning them and he's giving them a solution. Give sadaqah, make istighfar so that you're not among these people. I've seen all of these women in the fire and they're in the fire for certain reasons. One of the things they're in the fire for, the Prophet Sallallahu mentioned in the hadith, تكثرنا اللعن, that you curse a lot. 
that the person, you know, they get angry and they just, they curse, they say, you know, they bring the curse of Allah, a curse of Allah upon their children or the curse of Allah upon their husband or the curse of Allah upon people. And then it comes back upon them. So the Prophet said, I've seen this is going to happen. So I don't want you women to be mm -hmm. one of those people. Okay. I don't want you to be like that. I want you to be different. So I'm going to tell you the solution. First of all, I'm going to tell you why it is so that you can try to check that from yourself. And if it does happen, I'm going to tell you how to get out of it with sadaqah and with, right. with uh, istighfar. And in reality, there are ahadith, as we mentioned, many ahadith in which the Prophet mentioned reasons why men are from the people of the fire. We mentioned as an example, the hadith of the two people being punished in the grapes. For example, do we think that most women will go to the hellfire, for example, because of riba? Generally speaking, you would say that riba, even though there are women who get involved in riba, but it tends to be many times, it tends to be uh, men that, are, yeah. that probably do that more. And there are certain things that perhaps women do more. So for example, the Prophet mentioned that whoever guarantees for me what is between his two jaws and what's between his two legs, I guarantee for him Jannah. That's something that is characteristic or, or, or it's typical of men, right? Mm. And yet there are <laughs> for women. So right. the Prophet's job is to warn people yeah, and to explain to people what is uh, what the danger is to them. And he's saying, you women, you, there's a danger for you. The danger is cursing too much. The danger is that you di you disregard or you are ungrateful to the blessings you've okay. been given. And when you're ungrateful to the blessings you've been given, ultimately that's ingratitude to Allah because he's the one who gave you those blessings. So that's how I see that particular hadith and that's how I think it should be understood. Okay, I think um, you're halfway out of the hadith. <laughs> We've still got okay. another half to go. So okay. I think you're right. I'm, I'm looking at the narration here and it does say you curse frequently and are ungrateful. Husband, so that's really the reason. It's not not for the fact that they're a woman or they are women themselves. Mm. It's because of these characteristics, because of these things that they might do. However, it goes on to say, "I have not seen anyone more deficient in intelligence and religion than you." Now, mm. this is more of a blanket statement, uh, really, that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is making to the women, and he says, "I have not seen anyone more deficient in intelligence." Imagine if somebody made that statement in the twenty first century; that like, it would be. PC would be all, all over the place and and the religion as well. So and this goes back to the question about how are they equal in their religion? How can someone understand this that the women are deficient in intellect and mm -hmm. religion? So this is no doubt a part of the hadith. The Prophet وسلم, uh, he said, "Ma ra'aytu min naqisati aqlin wa dinin aghlab li di lubin minkun." So let's quote it properly. He said, I have not seen those who are more deficient in intellect and religion who overcome a person, who overcome a man of, uh, what's the word? They overcome a, a man who, who doesn't have that, yet. the man who doesn't have that issue. They overcome him completely mm. than you. So the first thing is, the Prophet said this to a group of women. Yeah, And those women, they asked You know, the Sahabiyat, Allah, may Allah be pleased with them They mm. didn't leave something without asking about it They asked the Prophet Qalat, ya Rasulullah Ma nuqsan al-aqli wa din O Messenger of Allah What is this deficiency in intellect and religion? Is it absolute? Is it in everything? Is it just the women are not clever? Or the women just don't have any religion? They're irreligious what is it? Tell us. Because the Sahabiyat, they were not worried about feminism and hmm. that wasn't their concern. Yeah. They were worried about what can I do? What, what do I have to do now? The Prophet said, and he said it in context. Let's give him the context. He said that how, how amazing it is that you see a woman who has two deficiencies hmm. overcome, completely overcome a man who has none of them. And you know the stories of this you know, yeah. for example, the yeah. poet who said, "Maraltu bi diari diari leila, uqabbilu dal jidara wa dal jidar. Ma hub al diari shagafan qalbi, walakin hub man sakan al diar." He said, "I went around the house, the house of Layla, kissing the walls, and kissing wall after wall. It's not the house that has overcome my heart, that my heart has just given into, but it's the love of the one who is living in the house." Mm -hmm. 
And this is a man who has all of the qualities of, of men. And there is a woman in there who is naqisa, aqlan wa deen, in her intellect and her religion. And this man is going around kissing the walls because of how much yeah. he's lost his mind. You know, they called him Majnoon Layla, hmm. the, the, the one who became crazy because of Layla. So this is the context in which the Prophet said, but the Sahabiyah they didn't leave it. They didn't just take the context okay. and say, okay, leave it. You know, that's the, it's in context. They said, tell us what, what is it? Where is there a nuqsan? Remember nuqsan means something which is not whole. Okay. Yeah, something which is less than complete. So he mentioned, the Prophet he mentioned two very specific things. He said, أَمَّا نُقْصَانُ الْأَقْلِ فَشَهَادُتُمْ رَأَتَيْنِ تَعْدِلُ شَهَادَةَ الرَّجُلِ He said, as for the deficiency in intellect, the witness of two women is equal to the witness of one man. He didn't say you women are not clever, you women can't do anything, you women don't know anything. You, he just said that there is a ruling in Islam mm -hmm. in which two women give a testimony in court in place of one man. Okay. That is less. Yani mathematically, yeah. yani, that is, that's less. That's a nuqsan. That's something which is less. And he said, regarding, he said, فَهَذَا نُقْصَانُ الْأَقْلِ He said, وَتَمْكُثُ الْلَيَالِ مَا تُصَلِّ وَتُفْتِرُ فِي رَمَضَانِ فَهَذَا نُقْصَانُ الدِّينِ He said, she spends a number of nights, a number of days, yani al-liyali in Arabic, whether you say it, it, nights and days are equal in this, yani. when you say one or the other, it means mm -hmm. the same thing. She spends days without praying and she breaks her fast in Ramadan. And this is deficiency in her religion. So let's just take a man, a man prays five times a day, 30 days in the month. A woman prays five times a day, 23 days in the month. That's yeah. a factual, yeah. less than that. That's not blameworthy for her. And actually, if you look at these two things, you see that neither of those two things are in the hands of a woman at all. There is nothing a woman can do to make her shahada equal to the shahada of a man mm. in Islam. That's the ruling of Al-Alim Al-Hakim, the one who knows everything and the most wise. That Allah Azza wa has said that. She can't do it. It's not her fault. It's not something she's blamed for. And Islam didn't even tell her to pray. If she prayed, she would be blameworthy. Mm. So this is simply a factual statement. Yeah. And the Prophet is saying in context of Look at this, you have a woman, she only prays 23 days in the month. This man prays 30 days in the month. And this man is walking around kissing the walls of the house. Look at the, right, 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 look yeah, at the, look yeah. at the difference. Look at how amazing this is. How Allah has created the male and the female. That even though this woman, if you looked at it factually one for one, you see that she's not doing the same things in her religion the man is doing. And that her testimony is not the same as the man. But in, he's still, still overcome by she her. Completely, yeah. He's completely yeah. overcome by her. Yeah. I don't think a woman would really have an issue with the, the second thing you mentioned, the fact that her deen is deficient because of she's not praying certain times. That's like a rukhsa that's given to her, no problem. However, why is her testimony not equal to that of a man? Like, can we not believe a woman's statement when she comes to court? Okay. The first thing we need to understand is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as we said, the one who created knows. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly told us, and the Prophet clearly told us, uh, and it's something well known in Islam, that the testimony, in most cases in a court, the testimony of one man, is if you replace it with the testimony of a woman, it requires two women. Now, the first thing to understand is that that's not an absolute rule. Okay. Uh, for example, the, the scholars mentioned that when a woman is asked about personal matters, such as her marriage, such as um, how her, for example, her idda, how long she has, uh, since she's been divorced, uh, how many menstrual periods she's had since she's been divorced, uh, when she gave birth, thing, things like this, mm -hmm. that there is no requirement for two witnesses in this. Uh, this, a woman is asked, this is her area, she knows herself better, and her testimony is, uh, is equal in that. It's also important to note that in things that are more important than testimony in court, Allah Azza wa accepted the statement of one woman. For example, in narrating a hadith, oh, our yeah. mother Aisha radiallahu anha narrates a hadith, nobody narrates this hadith except her. <laughs> Do we true. say, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, Ummi, you have to bring 
another woman who who heard this hadith not. with you. We accept it from her. So this is a hala khasa. It's a unique situation that Allah Azza wa Jal decreed for a wisdom that is with Him Subhanahu wa Taala, and it's our job ultimately to submit to it. Can we understand, take out some of the wisdoms behind it? Yeah, I believe you can take out some of the wisdoms behind it. I think that this kind of situation about testimony, I think uh, if we were going to put it in a in a way that, in a modern way, some people talk about the issue of uh, emotion and emotional intelligence. You know, this issue of a woman seeing things from a very um, emotional way mm. and that could potentially... Uh, damage a person's testimony, you know, at the end of the day, if you see things like that. And I think that, again, the Sharia deals with the majority. Sharia doesn't deal with everybody in every country, in every situation. It looks at the whole picture and says that this is what Allah has decreed is best for you, that the testimony of one man for two women, as we said, it's not, there's no takalluf in that, there's no hardship in that for a woman. Because if there's hardship in that for a woman, then it's, for example, in her personal matter, she comes and my husband mistreated me. Just, yeah. I'm sorry, if you don't have another yeah. woman to, to, to tell me, I'm not going to believe you. No, it's not the case. Her personal situation is different. And we don't apply it in what is more important, which is the narration of the hadith. We apply exactly what Allah revealed and what Allah commanded us. And that's what Allah commanded us. And from the wisdom of that, you can see the court's an intimidating place. You've seen how, you know, these days, yeah. we have the people questioning and the biases and so on. Maybe that's part of the reason. Maybe it isn't because ultimately, the ultimate reason why we do it is because Allah... Azza wa Jal commanded us to do that. Okay, let's go into the issue of marriage. And I think this is where a lot of the questions come. So this is probably going to be quite a large segment. And the first question, I think the, the predominant question that a lot of people ask, why are men allowed four wives, but women can't have four husbands? Yeah, there's no doubt that a man is allowed uh, four wives. Allah Azza wa Jal said, Allah Azza wa Jal said, marry whomever you will from among the women, two or three or four. And obviously, if a person is not able to be fair, then one. So Allah Azza wa Jal uh, gave permission for a man to marry more than one wife. You have to also remember, to put this into context, that prior to the coming of the religion of Islam, mm. the culture among the Arabs was unrestricted marriage on the side of the man. A man could have 10 wives, 20 wives, 30 wives, and Islam considered that to be unjust. Okay. So Allah Azza wa Jal limited it to four, that that is the most that a man can fairly, and he can, can be fair to, can be just to. So it's an issue of not equality because a woman can't have four husbands, yeah. but it's a matter of fairness. A man can be fair to four women, but he can in terms of sharing equal time, equal wealth and so on. But more than that, he cannot be fair. Okay. So Allah Azza wa Jal didn't give that to him. Bear in mind also that Allah Azza wa Jal also didn't, ob didn't obligate or make an obligation upon him to take four wives. Most of the scholars or many of the scholars hold that this is something that is mubah, is permissible, but it's not recommended. And some of them hold that it is recommended mm -hmm. for a man to have more than one wife. And some said that it's not recommended, but it's simply something which is allowed. So ultimately here, it's not the case that a man is required. It depends on him. Is he able to manage that or not? To be honest, I would say in our time, it's very rare that you find a brother that can actually handle mm. and be fair and just and can actually properly marry more than one woman. Very rare. It's not impossible, but it just you don't see it very often. And it's not that common in our time either. And Islam doesn't, you know, force it upon anybody at the end of the day. But there is a difference between the male and the female in this. Let's just talk about one issue, just as a simple example. Let's talk about protection of lineage. Okay. You have a woman who has four husbands. <laughs> and ultimately, that Islam, one of the overriding things that Islam came to protect and preserve is al-ird, someone's honor, and a nesab, people's, you know, people's lineage and their honor and so on. So within that, uh, it, it's not... Uh, it, it wouldn't be practical and it wouldn't be uh, acceptable really to anyone for a woman to have more than one husband. It, it would be in terms of the issue of the, the issue of honor. And, you know, the, for example, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us about the punishment of the man who is not, he doesn't have ghira over his wife. He doesn't have, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't have, protect, feel protective over her. Mm. So how about, you know, this man, you know, when you hear now, to be honest, when you yeah. hear news stories of, 
you know, this, these couples in open relationships. Yeah. There's no Izza in it. Yeah, right? no. There's no honor in it. And when you see a man who has two wives and looks after them properly and gives them equal time, that's how Allah created the man able to do that. And the woman generally from a fitrah perspective wouldn't want it usually. And the reason for that is, even if you look at society in general across the board, what you see is you see that in cultures and non-Islamic cultures where people marry more than one, I can't think of any examples where a woman takes more than one husband. Mm. But you can think of many examples around the world where people take more than one wife. And that's not an evidence, but that's just to point that it's sure, from the fitrah. Sure. Like it's, it's a natural feeling and a natural thing for a man to take more than one wife if certain things are present. Sure. With a limit of four, not to go over that. And it's natural for a woman that she would only want to have one husband. That's what's that's what Allah Azza wa brought, and it's natural. And, so the, I, yeah. and the protection of lineage. I thought you were going to say that if yeah, protection of lineage. If a woman has more than one husband, it doesn't protect the lineage. If she gets pregnant, yeah. then it's yeah, and we're not let, you know. It's not if someone say well, we have DNA tests right now. Like really, are we now going to like <laughs> every child in hospital has to have the DNA test attached to yeah. them? At the end of the day, like we said, the Sharia deals with every place, every country, every situation. It doesn't deal with you know what's happening in in England in twenty twenty or 2021 and it deals the whole world the yeah. whole time from beginning to end so ultimately for protection of lineage and ultimately it's just not natural it's just not that's why when you hear about people you know even now someone comes and says oh yeah you know I, i'm in an open relationship you know, me and my wife both have multiple partners you kind of like a person yeah, they they can't it's not like it's horrible yeah, and you say, ah, astaghfirullah what's wrong with this person would you know for the same way if a man came to you say i've got a wife and a mistress <laughs> a wife and a mistress yeah I would agree with you totally. I would say that's terrible because that's dhulm. What if he says that's part of my fitrah? That's just the way I was created. I would say to him, what you, what you don't understand is that you need to actually take that mistress as a wife, not as a mistress, because you're not giving her any rights. You could leave her tomorrow and you could leave her with nothing just on the street. You don't give her any rights. You don't look after her. You don't take care of her. She doesn't have a right to your time. Uh, so even if the scholars of Islam even debated misyar, where a man willingly, a woman willingly marries a man on the condition that the man won't give her her rights. Oh. And he, he says like, I'm not going to give you anywhere to live. And she agrees to it. But, and she happily agrees to it. She, I'm fine with that. I will live with my parents. I'm more than her. I just want to get married. Even the ulama differed over this. How wow. about somebody who took a, a mistress? Yeah, and it's not, that's not, that's not the, from the rights of a woman. Yeah. And even then, if a woman was to write in her marriage contract and to, and to say that, for example, I don't give my permission for my husband to take more than one wife, it's a matter the scholars differed over. Okay. So, it's not a case of oppressing women. And actually, wallahi, I can honestly say to you, there are situations I personally know today, right now, where there are women who actively look to be a co-wife. For example, there's a woman, she's a bit older maybe, she has her own life. Mm -hmm. It's not that she can't get married, she can get married to someone who doesn't have another wife. Mm -hmm. But she has her own life. She says, look, I don't want the hassle of this, you know, I can't manage this thing yeah. of having my husband with me all the time. There are countries where there are way more women than men. Mm, yeah. You know, at the end of the day, Islam, it's, it's wrong for a person just to put these like blinders on and they only see what's in front of them in their country. Okay, if you don't see it to be suitable in your country right now, but you believe it's from Allah, but you don't believe it's suitable for you, Allah didn't require you to do it. Allah didn't ask you to do it. If you don't believe it, it doesn't work for you. But then don't say it doesn't work for everybody right, in the world. Right, right. Because there are many, many countries where it works very, very well and it's needed. And there are countries where there are a huge number of, of, uh, of women outnumbering uh, men. There are, there are women who, and I'm talking about in societies where there are, you know, there are plenty of opportunities for marriage. Just say, look, to be honest, for me, uh, you know, I don't really want to have that full time looking after a husband all the time like that. I just... I, I would be just happy, you know, if I, I see him from time to time, that's that's better for me. Yeah. There are people like that. So we shouldn't, because it doesn't work for you, doesn't mean that it doesn't work for everybody. Okay. Okay, let's move on to something that is obligatory uh, for all women, according to the majority of the scholars. Why is it that a woman has to seek permission from her male guardian before she is to get married? Isn't that really just giving authority to the men to do kind of whatever they want with their women? No, I actually think that the uh, system of having a a chaperone or a guardian uh, in relation to marriage is there to protect the woman, not to oppress her. And that's because typically, if you look at uh, societies that didn't have this before, 
there was no protection for the woman and she might fall for a guy or just like a guy or a guy you know give a, you know gives her some attention and she doesn't look if he's good or not for her or when it comes to negotiating or discussing about things like the mahar about you know how much money she's going to receive when she gets married or what he's going to give her or where they're going to live mm -hmm. she doesn't have anybody to stick up for her she's going to sit there and negotiate with the guy's family like that mm -hmm. Uh, the, the the job of the wali is to look after the girl that is in his care. It's not to oppress her. And that's why we have a system to handle when the wali oppresses a woman. And that's what we call al-adal, where a wali prevents his daughter or the woman under his care from getting married. And she's got a good proposal and he says, I don't, I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna help you. I'm not gonna get you married mm -hmm. to this person. And in that case, she has the right to go and complain. And until today, this is very common. And you, you know, if you go to the, the courts or you go to the masajid in the countries where there aren't courts, it's full of people coming and say, you know, this is what's happening. And the imam simply says, okay. Or the judge simply says, okay, bring the father to me. What's your reasoning behind refusing this proposal? He said, I'm refusing this proposal because, uh, you know, I don't want her to marry a religious guy or I don't think it's good for her to marry a religious guy. Straight away, he takes that right away from the parent, give it to somebody else, so he takes care of it himself. The whole purpose of this is to protect the, to protect the woman. That's why the Prophet ﷺ said, He said, I'm going to burden you men with two things. Haraj, you know, the religion is not a religion of haraj, right? Mm, yeah. Two people in society, you have to take care of them. al yatim wal mara The orphan and the woman, you have to take care of her. So the job of the wali is to find a good person for her, to make sure that her decision that she's made on who she wants to marry is being made with her eyes open. And also to make sure that the marriage itself, she's getting her rights. And she has someone to stick up for her rights and negotiate for things on her behalf and make sure that she's getting all of her rights. And to be honest, I think if you just look at societies where they don't have that, and people just get into relationships and go out. You can, to be honest, you can see the harms that has upon people. It's so easy. People, you know, take people in. Uh, they they take pe advantage of people. Mm -hmm. You know, they sweet talk them. They you know give them a bit of attention, and then suddenly you realize this person. Hold on a second. You know, this person is already in another relationship with somebody, or this person is uh, doing something they shouldn't be doing, or they're not willing to give you your rights, or they're not good for you. I have to have some something there that makes that guy scared mm. you know that future husband makes him actually fear Allah and sometimes people fear Allah because of their taqwa and sometimes fear they fear Allah because of the you know the sultan any yeah. the authority that is over them so that's important to have somebody there to give that protection and that uh, cover for her it's not there to oppress her and that's why she has the right to complain if it's not done properly what if a sister says that i mean i'm i don't need looking after i'm you know i'm living in the 21st mm -hmm. century i'm quite capable of marrying myself to someone else why has islam obligated someone to look after me all the time again i would say that islam is a religion of submission and our job is to submit to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and if that's what allah is, has legislated there are many times we think we know something is good for us and it's not good for us Perhaps you hate something, it's good for you. Perhaps you love something, it's bad for you. Allah knows and you people don't know. Many times we think we know what's good for us. Mm. And yes, there is a movement in this society that's telling women that you don't need this, you mm. don't need this. But to be honest, when you just open your eyes and look around you at other people, you actually see how much it's needed. Mm. And you actually realize that to be honest, yeah, it is needed. And yes, it's also needed for the men to take that job seriously because there are situations where the wali doesn't take the job seriously. The wali is just, you know, either doesn't care. A lot of times in cases of, of, of Muslim uh, reverts, revert sisters, the wali doesn't care to bring anybody just, you know, as I'll say, uh, I'll, I'll do the, sign the necessary form or whatever. But actually those marriages, you know, subhanAllah, there are difficulties yeah. in that for many people, not for everyone, but for a lot of people, yeah. there are yeah. difficulties. And again, we also say and remind people that it's not about individual people. There are individual women who be perfectly capable of and fine if they did this by themselves. But it's not about individuals. It's about what's right for the whole Muslim community. Yeah. And it's about showing your submission to Allah in Islam. This is what Allah has decided for me. I believe that there is a wisdom, whether I can see that wisdom or whether I can't see that wisdom. For me, I look at it and to me, it seems 
very clear, but maybe that's through marriage counseling and dealing with divorces mm. and things like that, that it seems to me to be very, very clear. But if it's not clear to you, you only have to establish Allahu amrana bihada. Is it Allah who commanded us to do this? If yes, then then you know, Allah 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 will not let us cause us to be lost. And both sides have to come with their part. Obviously, it's for the women to submit, but also the, for the men, it goes back to their qawama not being something praiseworthy or something good. It's actually a huge responsibility that they're going to be questioned about on the day of judgment. It's a huge responsibility. Allah said, well, He took from you as a heavy oath. It's a heavy, it's a weighty responsibility. Your marriage to a woman is a very, very heavy responsibility and serious thing in the sight of Allah. And the one who doesn't treat that woman well, they will have to answer to Allah for that. Mm. Okay, the next question I have is, uh, again, it seems like a, a bit of uh, inequality here where men can marry Jewish or Christian women, but it can't happen the other way around. Women can't mar marry Jewish or Christian men. Why is that? So Allah told us in Surah Al-Ma'idah, وَالْمُحْصَنَاتُ مِنَ الَّذِينَ that you are permitted to marry the uh, chaste women who were given the book before you. Uh, in reality, the fact that you're permitted to marry them doesn't mean necessarily that it is uh, a it is a good thing to marry them. But it's an option that obviously uh, isn't it's available. an option that's available. And I say that because I don't want also for for men watching this to think that this is necessarily. Uh, the best thing for them to do or this necessarily a good thing for them to do or even consider this to be an option because the society that we're living in today has a lot of it brings about a lot of difficulties when people uh, get into these kind of relationships or it can do so the first thing is is very simple we've already established the issue of qawama yeah. of the man as the head of the household mm. if that's the case then how could we have a Jewish or a Christian man as a head of a household over a Muslim woman. True. And Allah has not placed for the disbeliever over the believer any authority. Allah has never given a situation where a disbeliever can have authority over a believer. And that would be something that, that's a blessing in Islam. And it otherwise, does, you know, the woman doesn't yeah. want to become, you know, Asiya, the wife of Fir'aun at the end of the day. She doesn't yeah. want to end up having a husband who is a disbeliever, who is an evildoer and so on. No, at the end of the day, this is why we have these rules because the man as the head of the household, at the end of the day, this Jewish or Christian woman is relatively close to Islam. You, we know that both Judaism and Christianity are share some, you know, certain amount of commonality within uh, the religion of Islam, even though there are many severe differences, but they are closer than other religions. And so it is possible for a Muslim man as the head of the household to have a Jewish or Christian wife and to still manage the household in an Islamic way. And that's the reason why I actually discourage it in our time, because I believe that the right of the man to be the head of the household has been broadly taken away from him in, in legal terms yeah. in most countries, particularly in Western countries. Yeah. And so he isn't able to enforce his authority upon his Jewish or Christian wife. And so she can turn around and say, well, I want my kids to be brought up as mm. Christians, or I want my kids to be brought up as Jews or I want my kids to go to church and you're not going to do anything about it. And he doesn't have any uh, any recourse to, to, to change that. Yeah. Or in some cases, the court systems will even support that. So that's why things are a little bit different today and they need to be, you know, that needs to be thought of very carefully. But it does work for some people, like a revert uh, man who is married to a, uh, a Jewish or Christian woman when they revert, it could be good for them to stay married to them. How that, that that last bit that you said that obviously you wouldn't recommend it, you'd actually discourage it for today. How do you reconcile that with your earlier statement that Islam is for all times and all places mm -hmm. and now Allah knew that this time and place would happen and yet it's a, a time and place where this particular ruling is perhaps discouraged? Yeah, I would say it doesn't change the ruling. So we don't say that it's haram and we don't say that it is uh, something which is uh, it would be invalid but we simply say that uh, it seems that looking at the framework of Islam and the principles of Islam, that there are some dangers in this and it should be given thought before entering into it. And this is something which is built in, that is a flexibility which is built into the rulings of Islam. You don't have a flexibility to stop praying five times a day because it doesn't suit you today, you know. But you do have a flexibility as to whether you marry a Jewish or Christian woman because Allah didn't make it an obligation upon you. He made it permissible. 
So that means it's something, things are permissible. Generally, things are obligatory, which you need all the time, except in cases of extreme necessity. And things are recommended because they're generally good for you, but if you miss them out from time to time, they don't hurt you. And things are permissible because they're things you might want to do and might not want to do. Mm -hmm. So this is something permissible, which people might want to do or might not want to do. And I would suggest that someone would have to think about it carefully in a time where, or in a country, where the court system is not going to allow that man to, uh, to act as the head of the household. And that woman does have the legal right to bring her children up right. as Jews or Christians, for example. The person should give that some thought. But I don't say that it's haram because the haram and the halal doesn't change. It doesn't become, you know, it doesn't become haram because we said so. And he, Allah has made it permissible. But it's just something that people should give consideration to. And it's permissible. Like the issue of two wives, we said, let's be fair. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that's fair. Here, yeah, that's fair. That I also think the issue of two wives is something which is permissible. And yes, it works for some people. But it also doesn't work for everybody. So a person should think about it carefully before they uh, start on that because it's not, uh, you know, it's not beneficial for someone just to marry someone else and then end up getting divorced to the first one. And it just goes like that, you know, a constant cycle of marriages and divorces doesn't yeah. benefit anybody. Okay. We spoke about the issue of obedience and kind of like, you know, obedience to Allah coming first and foremost from both parties. However, specifically when we look at the husband-wife relationship, it does seem like there's a tone that the wife has to obey the husband. And you kind of mentioned before that the wife has to obey the husband as long as the husband isn't commanding her with anything that goes against the commands of Allah. Having said that, there's like really strong wording from some hadith from the Prophet wasallam. For example, if I were to command anybody to prostrate to anyone other than Allah, I would have commanded women to prostrate to their husbands. Again, we're going through a process where a woman is kind of growing up and she's under the care of her guardian. The male guardian marries her off to the husband and now suddenly she's in a relationship where she has to obey to the letter everything her husband says, obviously with the exception that if he commands her with something that is against the religion. Mm. I think you use the word uh, married her off there. Uh, I just feel that that was, you know, we have to be clear that a woman is not allowed to be forced into marriage in Islam. Okay. Yeah. He facilitated her marriage, but I mean, marriage. It's not. It's not wrong. But I just think that people need to understand that we're the not talking about. Yeah. We're not talking about her being forced into marriage here. Forced marriages are not allowed. Forced in Islam. marriage is not allowed. And if a woman is forced into marriage, she's given a choice. And this is from the wisdom of Islam, by the way, that she's given a choice and she's not forced even a second time to leave, because huh. that's not fair on her. Now she's in a marriage. There was a woman. She came to the Prophet sallallahu and she said that I was forced. My father forced me into marriage. And the Prophet said, I will give you a choice. If you wish, I will dissolve your marriage. And if you wish, you may remain with your husband. She said, no, I want to remain with him. I'm actually happy with him. But okay, I, I, wanted the, I wanted the people to know that they're not allowed to force a woman into marriage. Mm. And she, she wanted what we call, what we would call now a test case. Right, yeah. You know, I just, yeah. I, wanted, I just wanted a judgment that you're not allowed to do it. But otherwise, I'm, I'm happy with who my father chose for me. So as for the hadith, of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it has different wordings, but the wording I have in front of me, لو كنت آمرا أحدا أن يسجد لي أحد لأمرت المرأة أن تسجد لي زوجها. If I were to command anyone to prostrate to anyone, I would command a woman to prostrate to her husband. Mm -hmm. In some of the riwayat of the hadith, it's mentioned the reason for this, and that is because of everything that the husband is required to do for his wife. So I actually see that, to be honest, to be a very positive thing that a woman has a husband that is commanded to do so much for her. He has to provide a house for her. He has to provide, uh, he has to spend upon her. He has to clothe her to the same extent that he clothes himself or with the same, you know, to the same standard that he clothes yeah. himself and all the things he has to take care of. That means that her, her, uh, her, what's the word? Her, her, that the gratitude that she should have for that is, is a great gratitude. Uh, for all the things that he does. And that's a similar thing that is said about the parents, for example. It's even emphasized even greater for the parents, what they did for you when you were small, yeah. how they looked after you. Islam is a religion of showing gratitude to Allah, first of all, and then showing gratitude to people who do good for you. And I think it's an amazing thing, you can turn to a very positive thing to look at uh, what a woman has to do in terms of the fact that so many things have been taken off her that have been put onto a man in terms of burdens and responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Uh, for example, the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, إِذَا صَلَّتَ الْمَرْأَةُ 
خمسها وصامت شهرها وطاعت بعلها that if a woman she fasts she prays five daily prayers and she fasts Ramadan and she obeys her husband with the conditions we mentioned in yeah. the sense of uh, in that which is permissible for Allah Azawajal, that she will enter Jannah it will be said to her enter Jannah from whichever of the eight gates that you wish and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put certain things upon the man that are difficult but he's put them upon the man because he sees that generally men generally men are suited for that responsibility and he's lifted it from the women because generally they're not suited for it so in that sense there is an imbalance in the sense that a man is required to do a lot for his wife really has to do a lot and he's told it to, we took from you a very heavy burden a heavy oath it's a big responsibility make sure you treat your women well and so on you see all of that and it does deserve uh, gratitude and then you also hear from the other side the ingratitude that will lead to the people being from the people of the hellfire which is the ingratitude when they say uh, I've never seen anything good from you so this is just the reverse side of that hadith and it doesn't mean that a woman should prostrate to her husband because the Prophet ﷺ didn't command that it simply means that if I were to tell anyone to bow to anyone out of what someone has done for them I would have told a woman to bow to her husband and that's showing that the great status of, of what the husband is required to do for his wife and I think that's not necessarily a negative thing I think if anything, a woman should be looking to take advantage of the things that she has been given that haven't been given to men. Right. Like, for example, the fact that she only has to pray her five daily prayers and fast Ramadan and obey her husband generally stick within the limits of Islam. And she said, enter any of the eight doors of Jannah you wish. As for the man, there's a door for certain things, a door mm. for another thing. He has to bring all of those eight huge actions of Islam. So ultimately she should take advantage of that. That actually doesn't mean that she's being given a, a necessarily something which is unfair. She's being given something that suits her mm -hmm. and the man's being given something that suits him. And now both of them should be taking advantage of that thing. The man should be saying, you know what it is? If my Jannah is in looking after my wife and taking care of her and spending on her and working and doing all those things, then that's what I should be seeking the reward of Allah from. Right. And if that woman says, well, if my Jannah is in now being grateful to my husband for that, like there is mentioned in the hadith, the Prophet said to one of the women to look at how you are with your husband. فَإِنَّهُ جَنَّتُكَ أَوْ نَارُكَ أَوْ كَمَا قَالَ صلى الله عليه وسلم For he's your jannah or he's your nar. He's either your paradise or your hellfire. Then she should be looking at taking advantage of that to get near to Allah. So it's not about one wanting to have what the other one had. But it's about each one saying, okay, this is what Allah has given me to do. Now let me take advantage of it. And what should the woman's intention be when she's obeying her husband? Should it be to please the husband or to please Allah or to both? No, ultimately, if her intention is only to please her husband, then the only thing she gets out of that is the pleasure of her husband. Okay. But if her intention is to please Allah, then she gets from that, inshallah, the pleasure of Allah and the pleasure of her husband. Because ultimately, as Muslims, we are required to submit. We're not required. You know, subhanAllah, so many things happen to you and you think, you know, this situation like this, how, like, you you know, maybe you would wish something would be different. I would wish I could have done this instead. I would wish I could have done that instead. But in Islam, you're told to submit to what it is that Allah has given. Don't seek what some of you have been given over others. Men have a chance to, earn. they've been given opportunity here. Allah has given you men a bunch of things. And this is your opportunity to earn reward. And women have been given a bunch of opportunities to earn Allah's reward. And ask Allah from His, from His bounty. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go on to another topic within the broader topic of marriage, and that is marital intimacy. Um, I have a hadith here that says, if a husband calls his wife to his bed, i.e. for sexual relations, and she refuses and causes him to sleep in anger, the angels will curse her till morning. Now, a lot of people see Islam as kind of uh, making it making marital rape permissible. It's almost like there's no such thing as marital rape. A husband can have intimate relations with his wife whenever he wants, and the wife has no choice but to obey. Do you mm. see why some people might find that misogynistic? No. Not okay. Really. I actually see that hadith is an evidence why marital rape could never be allowed. Because she is under threat of punishment from Allah for not complying with her husband's advances or not answer, not not uh, responding to her husband's advances. But she, uh, the Prophet didn't say to the men that if the wife says no, then force her. Mm. 
So uh, to be honest, and the second thing is Allah Azza wa Jalla said, "Walahunna mithlu ladi alayhinna bil ma'roof," that men have, the that she has what men have over her, and that as men have rights over their wife, women have rights over their husbands. So why wasn't it mentioned like that? So Sheikh Al Islam Taymiyyah, rahimahullah taala, was one of the people who mentioned that this is from the rights of the wife as well as the husband, but it is more emphasized in the right of the husband because of the nature of men and because of the danger to him in terms of his, his uh, you know, religion and practicing his religion properly, that men are typically, generally speaking, in this regard, more impulsive, uh, more likely that if they don't satisfy their desire in a way that's permissible, that they might start to think about doing so in a way that's impermissible, which brings harm upon that woman, by the way. Hmm. And ultimately, I also think that before all of this, go back and say, I mean, there is an, on, on that topic also, there are ahadith about the man taking care of his wife in terms of intimacy and uh, not rushing her and so on and so forth. That's a right of the wife as well, but obviously we're not talking about that because <laughs> feminism doesn't look at the, the rights that women have <laughs> yeah, in Islam. It's a one-side yeah? one yeah. discussion. Uh, but if we go back in the beginning, first of all, this whole idea of individual consent uh, in each individual instance is not a part of Islam in reality. Okay. In Islam, marriage provides a general consent to intimacy. When you marry someone, there is an understanding that the couple will be intimate with one another. That's the right of the wife, it's the right of the husband. The wife can go to the Qadi and say, my husband is not taking care of my rights in terms of intimacy. And the Qadi can say to the husband, he can bring him and he can say to him, this is something you must do. Uh, otherwise, there, you know, the, the marriage could be broken apart, there could be uh, you know, penalties upon you. And more than that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will become angry with you because you're not fulfilling her rights. But the nature of men is that you have to emphasize this. That if a man comes to his wife uh, and he has a particular need in that sense, in reality, that man is very easy to him for him to fall into haram. Hmm. So the woman is told, look, take care of your husband in this regard. Because ultimately, for example, the Prophet said that if a man sees a, a woman that uh, he's uh, impressed with or amazed with, then he has to go back to his wife. For she has what the other one has. In other words, men are like that. And it's, it's a, this is a flaw within men. And if, he, if he is satisfied one way or the other, and he, khalas, that's enough for him. So ultimately, he goes back to his wife and she knows that when he uh, requests that from her, she has to answer that request and comply to it. And that's from the general understanding of marriage. He doesn't have the right to force her. And we know that from the same hadith that you quoted because mm. the angels are angry with her or the angels curse her until the morning, which means that he has no right to force her. And in that case, this is part of the general understanding of marriage. Because generally, you know, these criticisms come from people mm. who in the first place don't understand the institution of marriage. Marriage is a general consent. When the woman gives her consent, and she does give her consent, because we said there's no forced marriage in Islam. She consents True. to marriage. She consents that I am going to be available for intimacy for my husband whenever Allah has made it permissible, as not when Allah Azawajal has made it haram. Mm -hmm. And the husband agrees, The husband agrees that she has the same right from me, but the right is more strongly emphasized because of the danger to the man and what that will bring back upon the woman as well, because it will bring back upon her. She's not going to be yeah. happy if her husband has got a wondering eye looking at every woman that goes past. So she needs to take care of her husband, but her husband also needs to take care of his wife, as there are many, as I said, a hadith in that regard in terms of the man taking care of his wife. And Shaykh Islam Taymiyyah, rahimahullah ta'ala, he mentioned in this that this is from the strongest of the rights of the wife that she has over her husband. Because one of the major purposes in Islamic legislation is to preserve honor and preserve reputation. In other words, preserve chastity and okay, so on and yeah, so forth. Yeah. So ultimately that's important for the wife. It's important for the husband, but typically men in that regard have a very uh, limited amount of sabr in that regard, a limited amount of patience, as opposed to women who typically don't have that kind of same impulsive sort of behavior in that way. You mentioned the issue of the Qadi a few times now throughout this podcast. Don't you feel like that's another example of a woman always having to submit to a man? It might not be the father, it might not be the husband, but ultimately when she has a complaint about either of these two parties, 
guess who she has to go to? It's another mm. man. It's not a female imam because we're not allowed that. It's not a female judge because we're not allowed that. How is that fair mm. on a woman? She's always underneath a man. Mm. So I think there's a couple of things here. I think first of all, uh, when it comes to seeking advice or when it comes to uh, complaining about her situation, she's free to complain or seek advice from anyone she wants, male or female. But in terms of the Qadi, there is no doubt the Prophet ﷺ mentioned لن يفلح, uh, لن يفلح قوم ولو أمرهم امرأة, that a people will not be successful who are the, the, their affairs are governed by a woman. The Prophet ﷺ said that. That's an authentic hadith. That's what he said, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. At the end of the day, that's a that's a reality from what Allah revealed to him. Now the Qadi, it makes perfect sense. If we just said that the testimony of the, the testimony of two women is required in place of a testimony of one man, and now you're going to make a Qadi a woman, what are we going to do? Bring two two female Qadis and yani, to judge on a matter. Reality is, if a woman then in in many societies is a female judge, is she going to have ten feeds? Because the most important thing a judge needs to have is the ability to carry it out. Would they not understand women better? So when women come to them with problems, a female advice, judge no would problem. understand. Let, let her go to her mother for advice. Let her go to her sister for advice. But the mother's not the one making the ruling. No, Allah is the one making the ruling. But no, the judge no, no, hold is... On, the... Hold on, hold on. Let's, let's stop here, yeah? Allah is the one making the ruling. The ruling is from Allah. The judge doesn't have the right. وَمَنْ لَمْ يَحْكُمْ بِمَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْكَافِرُونَ Whoever doesn't rule by what Allah has revealed, it is they who are the disbelievers. So let's just say there's a woman who wants to get married. Okay. Her father is not permitting that. Okay. They go to a judge. Allah has not revealed the exact ruling for this particular situation because obviously okay, every situation Allah, is different. Okay. Allah, so the, Allah revealed the ruling in this situation. He, he revealed principles which uh, by which the judge can make rulings. Yeah, no, but no, Allah this, revealed the ruling. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed that it's not permissible for you to prevent your women who are under your care from getting married. That's a ruling. What if she wants to get married for, uh, for to someone who the father believes that it's someone harmful for her, but she doesn't. So there's a situation now where you've got two okay. people who are genuinely, like the woman believes it's right for her and the man believes it's not. And they have okay. to go to a Qadi, talk it out, hear both sides. But that Qadi so is he's going to hear both sides? He's going to hear both sides, but naturally emp empathize. What's he going to rule by? He's, he's going to rule, well, he's a human being. He's going to rule so by what could, Allah could revealed, right? It, it, well, it's a human being as well, so he's going to try, but it could be emotions involved. Naturally, he's going to be empathized more with a man because. But he's if a, man a woman himself. was involved, there would be no emotions, huh? If, if a woman was, <laughs> at least if there was a woman involved in any of these positions, she has the opportunity to be heard by someone who can understand her better. Is what many people might say. I still, I don't, I don't think that. I think there are too many issues with it. I don't see how that can match with what we've just spoken about about the testimony of the woman. I don't see how also it can match with when we talk about uh, the issue of ten feet. The issue of it, that woman, how is she going to impose her authority upon that man? Mm. It's very difficult. And I, I, I've been in situations where I've been asked to judge. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you one thing. Whenever someone comes to me and says, we want a judgment, I will say, look, I, I, nasiha I can give you. But I can't give you a judgment because I don't have the ability to make 10 feet. I don't have the ability to carry it out. That my word will be taken. And mm -hmm. what I tell you, you are now going to be obliged and you're going to be under, the th under threat if I don't, if if you don't carry out what I say, mm. so I personally see that this this is a matter that Allah Azza wa Jalla has given uh, to men like prophethood, and Allah Azza wa Jalla said, "Allahu a'lamu haythu yajalu risalata." Allah knows better where to put prophethood. Mm. I mean, you and me could say it's not a gender thing. You and me could sit here and say, "Why did Allah not make us prophets?" Because Allah knows better where that belongs to. Yeah. And Allah Azza wa Jalla gave certain things in authority. If a man is in charge of a household. And then you want on top of that to be a female judge to be in charge of him. It doesn't make sense. Yeah? And it, doesn't, it doesn't match with, it's not consistent with the rest of the rules of Islam. And there is no issue with her going to a female for advice. The, the women from the Sahaba, they used to go to the mothers of the believers. They used to ask them for advice. They used to ask him for rulings, for a hadith they had heard from the Prophet wasallam. But ultimately Allah has placed the issue of authority and leadership and so on in the hands of men. And that's for Allah to place. That's not a man who has placed it in the hands of a man. Allah Azza wa Jalla has placed it. Now that doesn't mean that there are no women on the face of the earth who would ever be suitable for that because we said the Sharia rules for the general situation and what fits everything, not what fits rarities and, and you know unique uh, situations. So I see going to a woman to ask advice, going to a woman to ask for hadith, going to a woman to ask for 
um, يعني information about what I can do or what I should do or where I should go to get my rights. This is all things that were that were done yeah. in the time of the Sahaba and those who came after them. But ultimately, the judge is going to be the one to make the decision. And above the judge, there is going to be ultimately, eventually, the ruler who is in charge of the Muslims who is going to also have oversight over that issue. And ultimately, finally, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to de- defend the rights of the people who are oppressed and they're going to ultimately somebody ha- might be in a situation where and a man could be in that situation where the only thing they have left is to complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because their rights were not recognized but in general generally speaking the islamic system does provide that protection for that woman and she's not going to that qadi to ask for that qadi's opinion mm-hmm. or his idea she's going to ask what did Allah azza wa jal reveal about this by what Allah revealed. I want to pick up on something that you mentioned, which was the hadith that a nation that is led by a woman would never succeed. If you're making it seem like in Islam, a woman can never have authority over any men. And that just seems so unfair. Mm. What about the situation, as we mentioned earlier, with regard to a man and his mother? A man has to obey his mother, right? Mm. And so that Wali al Amr, who is in charge of the Muslims, uh, ultimately has. You know, he, he has to obey his mother. And, and the, uh, we mentioned the hadith when the Prophet said, Ummuk, three times, your mother, your mother, your mother. And the ulama, generally speaking, many of them held the opinion that this hadith refers to obedience, not just to love. That this refers to, that one of the, the hadith talks about husn suhbati, the, the excellence of my companionship. But many of them said that entails ta'ah. It entails obedience. So I personally don't think it's the case that there's never a case, but generally qawama has been given to men. We established this right at the beginning of the podcast that authority, generally speaking, has been given has been given to men. But there is a balance in that. There are cases. Uh, and you know that generally speaking, in terms of the obedience uh, of a, a son or a daughter to their mother, that's just one example. But the idea that men have been given a certain amount of responsibility over women throughout the society, that's consistent. It wouldn't be, con- and I would talk about this, it's important because inconsistencies are a sign of something that, di- that didn't come from Allah. Mm-hmm. Consistency is a sign that something came from Allah. So you have consistency in that. And we said authority isn't necessarily a good thing like in the hadith of Abi Dhar that we mentioned and Allah knows best. Going back to marriage then, we're now going through the marriage process. We have a situation where a wife is actually disobedient to the husband. What can the husband do? I have an ayah here, and the key part of the ayah that I want is wadribu hunna, beat okay. them. Islam allows women beating, wife beating. Is that mm. the case? I think the 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 choice of translation there is a, a translation that is intended to convey whether deliberately or accidentally, because I know that's how the often how the ayah is translated and beat them wadribu hunna. Actually, the ayah starts with wafaibu hunna, uh, admonish them. And abandon them in the bed And hit them Now here the first thing is This word hmm. It has a wide usage in the Arabic language Now I'm not getting away from the fact that it says hit okay. It says okay, hit yeah, I'm, not, I'm not dodging that at all It says hit them It doesn't say You know it doesn't say hold their hand yeah. right. But it ha- this word darb has a wide range in the Arabic language Okay From the usage of it in the Arabic language is for example, in tayammum, in the hadith of tayammum, we're told to, to strike the ground, mm-hmm. yeah, with the word darb, yeah? Yeah. yeah? It's tayammum, yeah? That's, that's it, yeah? This is darb here, okay. one finger. And also darb is, you know, beating, mm. uh, that the Prophet Sallallahu criticized the man who beats and rebuked the man who beats his wife like a person beats their horse. Hmm. So how do we know which one it means in, in this okay. So this is very important now. There are two things that teach us that we can understand what this means. The first thing is, and the more important one, is the sunnah. But before we go to the sunnah, I just want to talk about a general Islamic principle. Okay. Ahada. Not your law doesn't oppress anyone. It is not conceivable that the hitting mentioned in here could be severe. It could be beating. It's not possible. Because it wouldn't match any of the rules of Islam. We sent you as a mercy to mankind. We sent you. The Prophet never hit anyone. He never hit a slave. He never hit uh, his wives. He never hit even a riding beast. He never hit anybody. So this uh, ayah, it actually has a story to it. Hmm. And this story 
And the, the, that issue is mentioned several times, but it has a story. And in this story is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, لا تضربوا إماء الله Do not hit the female servants of Allah at all. Okay. So this is what was revealed in the first instance. You are not permitted to hit any woman ever. Okay. Okay. In any way, including one finger, two fingers, slap with the hand. You're not allowed to hit them at all. It's not allowed. فَجَاءَ عُمَرْ إِلَى رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ فَقَالْ Umar, he came to the Prophet صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ and he complained. He said, دَائِرْنَ النِّسَاءُ عَلَىٰ أَزْوَاجِهِنْ He said that when you have said this now, these women are going beyond. They are, they are, they are like... Uh, transgressing against their husbands they're doing anything they want because they they don't there's no there's no consequence to it so the prophet وسلم, allowed for a man to hit his wife I haven't established what kind of hitting that is okay. but he allowed for a man to hit his wife now this is amazing a number of women, a lot of women, they came after this and they went to the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because we are judge, your judge issue you had before. Yeah. They went to the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they complained, our husbands are hitting us now. Our husbands are hitting us now. فَقَالَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ لَقَدْ طَافَ بِآلِ مُحَمَّدٍ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ نِسَاءٌ كَثِيرٌ يَشْكُونَ أَزْوَاجَهُنَّ لَيْسَ أُولَائِكَ بِخِيَارِكُمْ He said, many people have come to the family of Muhammad, many women. I've come to the family of Muhammad وسلم, to complain about their husbands who are hitting them. Mm. He said, these people who are hitting their wives, they are not the good people among you. They are not the best people among you. So now we have another hadith in which the Prophet وسلم, he said, فَإِن فَعَنَّ ذَلِكْ فَضْرِبُوهُنَّ ضَرْبًا غَيْرَ مبرح. He said, if they do this, then you may hit them with a hitting that leaves no mark. Mm. Al-Mubarrih is the one that leaves redness or it leaves a mark. So this hitting, is made, this is a big mountain being made out of a molehill, to be honest with you. Because the hitting that is mentioned is so minor that it wouldn't even be considered to be of any significance other than a, a gesture to show and this husband who is so good to his wife and so kind for him to raise two fingers. Some of the ulama, they mentioned the siwak, mm. for him to take the siwak or to take a finger and tap her with the finger, that she would be so distraught by this, that this such kind husband and good husband to her has resorted to this level that he's willing to take his two fingers and hit me like this without leaving a mark. Allah, this is just, it's making something into something huge. After that, the Prophet said, the people who do this are not the best of you. They're not, they're not the good people among you, the best people among you. The Prophet never did it, not even one finger. Mm. So here we see that what happened was there was two, uh, two st strong examples both ways. There was a time when they were not allowed to do anything mm -hmm. and the women started to transgress against their husbands. Then there was a time when they were hitting their husband, when they were hitting, the husband was hitting his wife and the Prophet forbade them from doing that because it was, they were doing too much. And they settled in the middle. What is the middle? فَعِذُوهُنَّ First of all, admonish them. Allah didn't say فَعِذُوهُنَّ شَهْرًا Admonish them a month. فَعِذُوهُنَّ أُسْبُوعًا a week. فَعِذُوهُنَّ until, Keep on telling them until you think that telling them makes no difference. وَهْجُرُوهُنَّ فِي الْمَضَاجِعِ And keep away from them in the bed. Some of the ulama, they mention is turn your back on them. You know, don't put out your hand. Just, you know, be separate from them. Sleep on the floor, sleep on the sofa. وَضْرِبُوهُنَّ And if all of that hasn't worked, you are permitted to hit them in such a way that it doesn't leave any mark. That's, I mean, I read my, we're not talking about something significant. We're talking about a gesture that shows uh, a, a, the displeasure of the man in what's happened. And it shows that he feels he's got no resort left except that. And it also shows where the marriage is going as well. Because it shows that if it's got to that point, what comes after? After that is, فَبَعَثُوا حَكَمًا مِنْ أَهْلِهِ وَحَكَمًا مِنْ أَهْلِهَا You bring a negotiator from her side and one from his side and you have to make peace, otherwise they divorce. So it shows that the matter has gone to such a level where the husband now feels he's got nothing left except that. And it's so minor in terms of 
what is what is permitted for the husband to do that really there's there re- it really just isn't significant enough for it to cause a woman any physical harm it's more about it's more of an emotional gesture to read because if that person was treating her so well and being so kind to her then for him to do that she stops and thinks wow this is you know things have really got to the stage where we in a, you know we need to sort things out yeah. Many people will believe that violence should never, ever, ever be an option in a marriage. But you're saying this doesn't even fall into the category of violence. Yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I honestly don't think it falls under the category of violence. I, I think that violence should not be used towards women. It should not be used towards children. I think that's a position of Islam. And I think the word violence and the word beating, these are words that we, we're taught when we study English, the English yeah. language. They have a particular emotional connotation. They are said to provoke a certain you know, reaction, you know, savagely beat, you know, these words are there to make a certain emotion within you. But what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala permitted is darban ghayra mubarrih, a hitting which doesn't leave any mark. It doesn't cause any severe pain or any lasting problem for a person. This is a gesture. And it's the same that you do with your children at the end of the day. It's the same thing you do with your children. You know, it's not something where you're not intending, who wants to hurt their kids? Who wants to hurt their wife? The Prophet said, how can one of you it's a profound hadith. He said, how can one of you hit his wife like he hits a horse mm. and then he sleeps with her at the end of the day? Mm. And how can, how can a person do that? I and mean, how can anyone of any intellect, of any respect, beat his wife like he would beat his horse, hit his wife like he would hit his horse, and then he wants to be intimate with her at the end of the day? These are not the people who are from the best of you. It's not what the Prophet ﷺ did, not even one finger. Mm. But... He allowed it as a last resort. A rukhsa is like, you know, okay, just as a last resort. SubhanAllah, perhaps this would save somebody's marriage at mm-hmm. the end of the day. It doesn't cause her any harm. It's like, I, to be honest, I see that if you look at your, your kids, being able to discipline your kids in that way that doesn't cause them any physical pain, but being able to, you know, tap them on the wrist or whatever is what actually sometimes SubhanAllah saves your kids from going in all sorts of directions. I personally don't think that has to be made into such a big thing, but it's made into a big thing by using emotive language, beating and all this kind of stuff and violence and domestic violence and also by the culture of some people because some Muslims right. do this. Yeah. And in their culture, they hit their wife, you know, darb al-fahl, like you hit a horse. You know, they, they, they hit their wife like that. And then this is associated with Islam when it has nothing to do with Islam. Some non-Muslims might be watching this and wondering why did Allah even leave it open with the usage of that word to give it the possibility for people, like you say, in their culture to use and abuse Islam in that way. I don't think it did. I think, first of all, the, the hadith of the Prophet clearly explains the limit. But more than that, even just the general concept of Islam, we said Islam came as a mercy to people. There is nobody who can conceive that this word means to beat and Arabic has is very particular in language. There are words which mean to beat severely. There are words like that. And that's not the word that is used here. So I, I personally think that, first of all, Islam is known for its mercy and softness. Mm. So nobody can realistically take this eye and think, oh, you know, this is, you know, this is the, 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 suddenly the opposite. Yeah. And then the Prophet said, every, at the end of the day, the ayat have to be understood like the Prophet said. As for why this was revealed, the Prophet himself said why it was revealed. Because when the Prophet stopped it from happening, it caused problems in people's marriages. And it became to the point that, you know, people were kind of using it against their husbands and saying, oh, you can't, you know, you can't even do anything to me. You're not even going to do anything to me. And the husbands came to complain and said, look, now you, you said this to, before we never used to hit our wives. But the fact that that was there, things were okay. Now it became out of control. So the Prophet allowed it, but he didn't allow it to go to that extent where the women came and they complained. Who did they complain to? Complain to the wives of the Prophet. Mm. How they feel, you know, there's a lot of lessons in that. And there's a, there's a balance in that. And it's just like I said, I, I really believe that when it comes to, for example, children, just yeah. to give an example people can relate to, oh, yeah. that if there isn't an ability to discipline your kids, that it, and at the end of the day, it leads to a lot of problems later on. But that discipline can never, ever reach the level of violence. It can never reach the level of harm. Because in Islam we have a principle la darara, wala dirar. There is not allowed to be any kind of harm or reciprocal harm in Islam. Okay, you mentioned actually in your answer there that if it gets to this stage of discipline and it's still not working, what's next? We come to the process of divorce. And that's another question that I have for you actually. Why is it so much easier for a man to divorce a woman in Islam 
rather than the other way around. If a wife wants to divorce her husband, she has to go through a huge process, court proceedings. Whereas a man wants to divorce his wife, just says talaq three times, khalas, it's done. There are so many things wrong with that. How do, how do we have to go back and break this question down okay. bit by bit? I think first of all, a man, it is not easy for a man to divorce his wife. That's the first thing. That's actually a, a talaq, which is talaq and sunni, a talaq according to the sunnah, is not easy at all. What do you mean by that? So there are there is a talaq which is according to the sunnah, and there is a talaq which is talaq and bid'i, which is an innovated uh, divorce. The divorce according to the sunnah has two primary conditions. The first thing is that the lady, she's not menstruating at the time. And that's just a mercy to her. Because for example, at that time, they're not intimate. At that time, perhaps emotionally, she's you know up and down. She has bad days. And it's not fair for her husband to take what's happening at that time and then maybe just get upset with her and divorce her. He's not allowed to divorce her at that time. And the scholars differ, does is the divorce happen or not? And many of them said the correct opinion is that it doesn't happen. And if he divorces her at that time, the talaq is not, is not even counted. That's the first thing. The second thing is that it should be in a period where they haven't been intimate. So for example, an average couple, let's just say that if there is still intimacy in the marriage, that man is going to have to wait a minimum usually of a month before he can even utter the word divorce. Mm. He could, before he can even utter the word divorce. As for the woman, she can go to the Qadi any time, by the way. She can go any time of the month, any time of the week, any one time she can go straight away. As for the man, no, he's going to typically have to wait several weeks before he can utter the word divorce. By the way, he only utters the word divorce once. Okay. It's talaq three times, you know. <laughs> yeah, and this is also from talaq bid'i, innovative talaq. Yeah? So he has to wait. He has to wait, first of all, that they have not been intimate. Her menses come. She now finishes her menses. They haven't been intimate. Now he can issue the divorce. That gives him time to reflect. When he issues the divorce, does she actually become divorced? No. What happens is now there is three menstrual periods, typically in most situations, some exceptions if they've only just been married, haven't been, so different things. But just to simplify, in most situations, three menstrual periods he has to spend on her. He has to live with her. He has to provide for her. He has to treat her as his wife. Now, that's typically three months. It might be more than three months for some women. All that time, he has to wait. At the end of that time, which we've now got to somewhere in the region of four months, depending on the situation, could be three and a half months, could be between him first intending to divorce her and actually the divorce actually taking place. The difference is that he doesn't need external confirmation for his divorce. Okay. He doesn't need the Qadi to okay the divorce for him. He can make the decision by himself. As for the lady, I believe this is from the, the Rahmah of Allah Azza wa Jal, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given it that she needs to have her divorce checked How is that fair? by a judge. Wallah is from a Rahmah. That she doesn't get upset one day and say, I divorce you. And then she's stuck on herself with no uh, option. Yani she, put, she finds herself having left her husband and oh, I didn't want to and whatever. So instead, she now comes uh, to the judge and says to the judge that I want to divorce my husband. The judge typically will ask her, okay, what's the reason for that? She'll say, this is my reason. And the judge will call the husband on the same day, sometimes on the same day, sometimes after a week. So it depends on the judge. Call the husband and will say to the husband that your wife has asked for a divorce. I believe the grounds of the divorce are valid. She's not just upset with you or something. It's real, genuine grounds for divorce. And the grounds for divorce are quite wide okay. for a woman. It's a genuine ground for divorce. She's going to return the mahar, the bridal gift yep. that you gave to her. And you are going to give her the, a, a divorce which is instigated from the woman, which we call a khula, which comes from the woman. And that happened in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So when she came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, she said, I don't complain about my husband. Don't say anything about his religion or anything about his character. But I can't, I fear for my religion if I remain with him. Mm. And I'm just, look, he's got nothing wrong in his deen. He's a religious man. His character is good, but just me and him, it's not working. Is that a valid ground for divorce? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam called him. He said, return the bridal gift to him. She returned a garden to him of the bridal gift. 
and the Prophet dissolved the marriage straight away. Dissolved, can So this idea of a man kind of like abusing his wife and a wife desperately trying to get out of the marriage, but she can't because the Qadi is not allowing it. It's, it doesn't really exist. It's not. I don't know. Saying. I think that's. I think it can exist, but it doesn't exist in Islam. Hmm. I think it can exist in times where Islam is not implemented properly, and that's the reality. Is whenever you don't implement Islam properly, you bring zulm upon everybody. Everybody gets oppressed. You know, men become oppressed, women become oppressed. Well, the men now, many men are oppressed, to be honest, by especially by this feminist ideology that is now spreading around us. Mm. At the end of the day, when you take Islam out of the equation, everybody oppresses. Men oppress women, women oppress men. Everyone is just oppressing everybody else. But when you put Islam there properly, there should never be a situation where a woman feels trapped in a marriage. And also bear in mind, in cases of severe violence, like where there's severe darr upon her, then I don't think there's any blame on her in that case leaving the house. Because in this case, this is a, a darura. And she fears for her life. She doesn't have to wait for the Qadi. Yeah. She leaves. Because in this case, she fears for herself. I mean, she fears for her life or she fears for her health like in a severe way. But generally speaking, most cases, look, most marriages are not like that. Most marriages, she's not happy with her husband. He doesn't listen to me. He doesn't understand my feelings and all this type of stuff. Okay, let her go to the Qadi and explain to the Qadi and let the Qadi just check the reasoning. That's all. Just make sure that it's not something someone says, look, you know, sometimes you want to say, look, sister, Allah, he's a good husband, you know, like he's doing good for you. You know, really, do you really want to go through with this? That's all it is. Right, it's that right, check right, and balance. Right. Do you really want to go through with this? As for the man, it's not expected that he will make that decision. And if he does make it emotionally, then he has such a long time before he can actually make it. Yeah. Now, in this way, if we say that typically a woman can divorce her husband quicker than a husband can divorce his wife, that actually is also a sign of the mercy towards the woman. That it, when she really is not happy mm. with her husband, she needs to get out of the marriage fairly quickly. You know, it's not a situation mm. where if it's really bad, she needs to get out of it quickly. And that facility is there for her. Whereas the man typically, yeah, he nah, he's got time. You know, like usually the man is not, I mean, it's very rare that women as domestic violence from the woman towards the husband mm. or something like that. You know, usually he has time to think about it. And he gives a divorce, let him take his time. The problem which has happened now is the bid'ah of the talaq, which is bid'i, in innovated talaq, where people are saying talaq, 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 and, you know, quick fire talaq, and kicking their wife out of the house on the first day, and all this type of stuff that is nothing to do with the religion of Islam, which brings dhulm upon her, and yeah. it doesn't give a chance for the marriage to uh, survive. And this issue of khula' and talaq, is it just terminology? Some people believe that khula' is in a proper divorce and the wife isn't truly free, like... Mm -hmm. What's this? No, I think that there's a different. There are differences between al and between talaq. There are fundamental differences between the two. That's why the two have different words. But in the sense that when the khula is done and the idda is finished, she's free to marry somebody else. I think that's it. that is enough of a divorce. And there is a third type as well. Let's not forget about al fasq. So there is talaq, which is instigated by the man. There is a khula, which is instigated by the woman. But ultimately, the husband is part of the process, right? Okay. The Qadi calls the husband and says, the husband will say, Khala tuki. I have issued your khula. I have agreed to your khula. What happens if the husband says, I don't agree? I'm not coming to see the Qadi. Mm. Very common in the West where the Qadi has no ten feet, as we mentioned, yeah. this issue of the Qadi has no ability to actually do anything. So the Qadi says, okay, bring the husband. The husband says, I'm not coming. So now you have something called fasq, which is annulment of the marriage. Okay. This is in the hands of the Qadi in certain situations that he can annul the marriage without the husband's permission. For example, the husband's disappeared. Years and years, he's, he's not, not been heard of. He says, I want to get married again. You know, this is not fair on me. I'm just sat here. There's no husband. We've tried to reach him. Don't know where he's gone. Maybe he passed away. Maybe he's, you know, maybe he's run off somewhere, but we don't hear from him. The Qadi finds out the reality of that situation. He can issue a fasq an instant annulment of the marriage. Uh, and so the issue of the khula, is it a talaq or is it a fasq? There's also a mas'ala, is the khula closer to a talaq? Is it a kind of talaq? Or is it really a kind of annulment that comes from the qadi? And that's a matter the scholars talk about when they talk about the topic of the khula. But what we need to establish is that when the khula is done, the woman has the right, once her idda is finished, her waiting period is finished, she has the right to marry somebody else. And that's enough to prove that a khula is a proper, you know, is a proper annulment of the marriage. Okay, let's move on from marriage and talk about something else now. The next place I want to take this podcast, is talking about the gender roles. So we obviously have this huge push 
right now that's going on, particularly in the West, about gender neutrality and how women are just as equal as men and they should be out in the workplace just as much as men. Is this something that Islam supports or not? You know, I think Islam has a really beautiful approach to this. It's not forbidden for a woman to work. Now, in terms of gender neutrality, we've, we've established that Islam is about justice. Yeah. Equality, this word equality is a mirage. It's a sarab, yeah? It's like something that whatever you do to try and achieve it, you end up oppressing somebody. Ultimately, what's required is adil, is justice. Justice is what's needed. Al-qist, fairness, is what's needed. As for musawa, just making everything the same, mm. that actually is not, it, it never works. And you can see so many examples just in, in real life in any way, even if you look at when people try to make people equal in terms of um, they, their living, you know, look at things like communism and things like that and socialism, about, you know, equal. Well, everything, you, you try to make this musawa all the time, you bring zulm if it's not from Allah. What Allah is brought is adil. So he did bring musawa, equality in some things. Okay. But those equality are in things like, for example, the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu that women are the full sisters of men. There's a degree of equality in that, in that sense. But it has to equality has to be within the framework of justice. As for working, Islam didn't prohibit a woman from working. Mutlaq, a woman is forbidden to work, haram for a woman to work. First of all, that would not be practical in any society. You have some women who don't have any uh, male guardian yeah. over them or anyone who's providing for them. And generally in Islam, actually, we have a beautiful thing. The state would typically provide for them. The ayama, the women who are unmarried, typically the Muslim state should pro provide for okay. them. They should look after them, should pay for their income and look after them, take care of them. They're from the people that Islam has uh, included within the Islamic welfare state. However, there's many times they can't do that. There's some situations in which a woman finds that she wants to do some work. First of all, there are some conditions to that. The first one, and this is about, about consistency, is that she has to have the permission, either from the guardian or either from the husband. And that's part of the same consistency in the Qawwama that we spoke about before. Yeah. The second thing is, most importantly before that, really, we should have made it the first thing, is that it's not haram. And that's an equal condition for a man and a woman, that they don't work in that which is haram. Okay. They don't work in that which is haram. Uh, and the third one is that it doesn't take away from the work she does, doesn't take away from the other responsibilities that Allah has given her. Like, For example, let's just say that she has a responsibility to look after her husband, generally speaking. And the work doesn't interfere with that. The husband is happy. I don't have a problem. But it's not the case that, you know, he, he's upset and he's like, look, you know, she's just a career woman and she's working all the time and I don't see her and it's like I'm not married. Like, that's zulm upon him because the marriage had a understanding that you two were going to get married under a certain set of rights and a certain set of understanding. So that has to be present. But the husband can, tenazel, he can say that I, you know, that I'm, I'm cool with this. I don't, I don't mind. It doesn't interfere with my rights. And there are some women who do some amazing work. Well, like, there are many jobs where we need women specifically in those roles. Dealing with, for example, dealing with females in certain aspects. Mm -hmm. We don't want men to be, be, be doing that. There are some things that women do amazing. I so much women contribute to, to, to da'wah, charitable projects, because often the man doesn't have time because he has to earn, he has to provide for his yeah. family. Whereas this work she's doing, it's not essential for her because the money that she has, at ultimately whatever money she earns is hers to spend. So a lot of the time there's more women are free to, to work in charitable, voluntary, da'wah type of roles because they don't need to earn necessarily a living from it because they already have someone. Of course, there are some women who need to earn a living, but I'm saying there's a lot of cases like that. So a lot of good comes from it. But ultimately, it's not, Islam didn't make it the default. The default is that the woman has every expectation that her father or her husband, if she's married, will provide for her. She has the right to say uh, to her husband, I'm sitting at home, you go home, you go out and work. I, I don't want to work. And I think that's something that a lot of people would appreciate. They would say that, okay, that's that's nice. That I don't have to work. A lot of women yeah. would say, I don't want to work. Why Why do I have to work? Like in this 50-50 system, you know, you need to pay half the rent. Mm -hmm. You need to pay half the bills. <laughs> you know, you need to pay. Someone says, I don't want to work. I don't want to do that. She has that. The default position in Islam is that the woman doesn't have to work. Mm -hmm. But she's not prohibited absolutely from work if it's something that works in her situation. 
her yeah. her husband her family it works for her so i think like uh, right now there's a huge work from home culture because of what's happened with the pandemic covid-19 and i think that makes sense that a woman is not forbidden from working from home but you run into problems once the covid pandemic goes away inshallah and women are going to be required to leave their houses because of course they're not allowed to leave the houses because Allah says waqawna fi buyutikunna remain in your houses and that's a, a commanding verb in the arabic language so how is a woman expected to live her life when the religion of islam is telling her she has to remain in a house okay so let's let's take this question in two parts let's take the first part about working from home first of all we establish a woman doesn't have to work in the first place so it's not a problem for her if, if she has to go out you know if her, her husband was working from home now he has to leave the house and go and work in the office that's his problem it's not yeah. her problem She's okay now. She's she, well, she doesn't have to work. But if she's got a job that requires her to leave the house, is she allowed to? Based on this ayah, is she allowed to leave is the house? She allowed to I leave think the women house. are allowed to leave the house. Okay, but how do you the reconcile that? that? <laughs> okay, I think can we establish on Isha? Is okay, we can establish that it's permissible for a woman to leave the house. <laughs> okay, I suppose, speaking, I suppose I would agree with that. How do you? Yeah. How do you? Let him na'u nisa'akum al masajid. Don't stop your women from going to the masjid. Wa buyutu hunna khayrun lahunna. This ayah wa qarna fi buyuti kun. First of yeah. all, it was revealed regarding the wives of the Prophet. Uh, uh, and it applies to the women after them okay. as well. I'm not going to okay, say okay. It. it's not an, an ayah that is only for this. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi explained this beautifully. There was a woman, she came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and she said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, I love to pray with you. He said, Your prayer in the in your your prayer that is in the masjid, in your local, your local masjid is better for you than the prayer with me. And your prayer in your home is better than your prayer in your local masjid. And we mentioned the hadith, وَبُيُوتُهُنَّ خَيْرٌ لَهُنَّ Their homes are better for them. So ultimately, this idea of covering, this idea of being concealed, this is a part of the modesty that Allah has required from a Muslim woman. So it is better for her to remain in her home. And she's not forbidden from going out when she needs to go out. But it's different for the man is told, فَانْتَشِرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ Go out. وَبْتَغُوا مِنْ فَضْلِ اللَّهِ Go out and earn. Why are you sitting in the house for? You need to get out and earn money. Go mm. out. You know, Umar radiallahu anhu used to criticize when he was in charge of the Muslims, when he used to see a young man sitting in the masjid in the time of work and he's, you know, sitting in the masjid just reading the Quran. He said, get out, go work. فَانْتَشِرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ Go out and earn something mm. because that's your job. As for the woman, it's not your job to go out and earn something. So stay in your home, stay around your home. But if you go to the masjid, there's nothing wrong with that. If you go to the market, the Prophet says in, in, in the time of the Prophet says, no one used to go to the market and buy things. If they just want to go out and see their friends, they're, they're allowed to? Go and see their friends. It's, this issue is not one of it being haram, yani, if, if that's something that they are able to do without compromising their religion. Because we have to be careful because you say, yeah, go out and meet your friends. And say, I go out and meet my friends in a nightclub or something. Yeah. You know what I mean? It, as course. long as it doesn't contra contradict what the religion says. And yes, we go back to the idea of the authority, the, the responsibility of the husband in the household. It has to be organized. But she doesn't have to have the individual permission for every time. Okay, what do you mean by that? There are two types of permission, right? There's a general permission and an individual permission. Generally, a woman knows my husband doesn't object to me doing one, two, three. Doesn't object to me going to see my friends, you know. Doesn't object to me uh, going to buy things from the shop. Doesn't object to me going to visit, you know, relatives or whatever. She knows that generally. She doesn't have to ask her husband every time because it's something that she knows from him. He doesn't mind it. But there are things she knows her husband will not be happy with. Right. And he's not going to, I know he's not always happy with it. So in this case, she should ask. And that also is part of the consistency of a man being responsible. But a man will also be asked. She says, I want to go visit my parents. The man says, no. So the man's going to be asked by Allah. Why did you say that? Is there a reason for it? Do you have a valid reason for it or not? So you might have a valid reason. He might say, I need you to be here. Well, there's a situation in the house. I need you to be here. And the right of the husband it takes precedence over the right of the parents once a woman is married. Okay. But if he says, well, I, I, don't, I, I want to keep you away from your parents. You know, I don't want you to see them. And that's oppression And he'll be asked about that oppression yeah. Oppression is darkness on the day of resurrection So I think that The Islamic system of a woman Being based around the house This is what is natural This is what is better for her And it's not forbidden for her to go out hmm. you know, It's not something which is prohibited for her to go out 
And if you look at the wives of the Prophet said, you look at what they did. Well, like, you know, their examples are amazing examples. You look at our mother Aisha radiallahu anha, what she achieved in her life. In all of the hadith of the Prophet said, she was the fourth, she narrated the fourth largest number of hadith of anyone among men or women. In fatawa, she issued more fatawa than everyone other than three other people. She was a resource for the men and the women, they would go to her. But she still implemented waqarna fi buyutikun. Yeah. Stay in your home. She primarily stayed in her in her home. She went out when she needed to go out for something, what they call khuruj ta'a, going out for obedience to Allah Azza wa Jal, going out for you know something in, in obedience to Allah. But ultimately, she achieved so much and she still implemented the ayah. So Allah Azza wa Jal has given us this because it's better for the person. And like I said, the man has been told the opposite. Tashiru fil ard. You need to go out and earn money. You shouldn't stay in your house. Uh, and I think that is what is natural and that is what works. And if you implement it well, lies, it doesn't cause any oppression to the woman at all. In fact, it actually gives her so much ability to actually do things instead of the man, you know, running around from place to place and, you know, trying to just make ends meet. She has so much she can do, so much learning she can do, so much teaching she can do, so much benefit she can do for the people like Aisha radiallahu anha did. So it's all about seeking that benefit that Allah has given you. Yeah. If Allah said it's better for you to stay in your home, then stay in your home and now earn reward from Allah Azza wa uh, But it's not prohibited for a And you mentioned house. implementing properly. I think that's a consistent theme that I'm getting from this podcast, that all of these issues, all of these rules, if they're implemented properly within the framework of Islam, it's not an issue at all. The problems come when people oppress one another outside of the framework that Islam has set. And it's not an issue that Islam has. It's an issue yeah. that people have. And I think there's another point on, on, on what you mentioned about the, uh, the woman going out and things like that, is that when a woman marries, it's really important that she finds someone who's compatible with her. You know, there are some men who, to be honest, he, he doesn't really, he's not very, you know, permissive when it comes to these things. Like he's not, he doesn't, you know, like, and there are some men who, ah, he doesn't mind, you know. So it's important that a woman looks for the right person when she mm. gets married. And this is also about the welly, you know, like it's important that the welly supports her in this, looking for the right person. Because if the two are not matching, she's a person who just cannot stay in the house, you know, even one day she has to go out. And the husband is a person who expects that his wife will only leave the house when it's on fire. That's a big problem, you know, yeah. compatibility yeah. problem. It's not that the wife is necessarily wrong or that the husband is necessarily bad, but they're just the it's two of them are not compatible with each other. And that's the type of thing that the well you should be looking at and making sure that, look, are you sure this is the right type of person for you? You should be asking those kind of questions to the husband as well. And I, I thought on that topic of the welly also, and I know we kind of finished the topic, but even this issue of how a, a woman can approach a man, it's really difficult. You know, if she doesn't have the welly, hmm. how is she supposed to like just, yeah, you know, yeah, just walk question. up to him and just like, <laughs> you know, hey, how are you doing? Are you thinking about getting married? <laughs> It's a means for her to actually be protected a little bit, a little bit, you know. Good point, yeah. And a lot of the things in marriage, like the mahar, are there to show the value of the woman. They say that the mahar, the wisdom in, in the mahar, in the bridal gift, is that a man actually has to work hard to get married to a woman. It's not like, oh, I want to marry you. It's okay, we're married. You know, like, he has to now go out and work. He has to earn money in order to just afford the bridal gift and to be able to spend on her, to be able to provide her accommodation. So now it's someone who's... She's worth something to him. It's yeah, not like she's yeah. like, she has a, you know, he's like, yeah, I have to, you know, to keep her, I have to really work hard. So she has a value yeah. in that sense. It's yeah. not something that has no value like the women of Jahiliya. Yeah, you alluded to it earlier. I think the nature of these discussions on the Hot Seat podcast are by default very one-sided. And if it were the rules were the other way around, we're actually having an open discussion about what men have been given, what women have been given, you know, a bridal gift that is uh, to, be, to be given to a woman. I'm sure there'd be some men who <laughs> like, that's not yeah. fair. What about me? You know, and the man has to, is obligated to provide for his wife and spend on his wife where it's not the other way around. So. I want to I highlight a point on that. Very interesting. You know, when you talk about uh, the bridal gift, look at countries where the woman is obliged to give a bridal gift, like a dowry. Okay. These are countries where female infanticide is through the roof. Uh, yeah, people kill their yeah, baby daughters. Like, yeah. because, and when you ask them, when the little girl is asked for what reason were you killed? 
many of them say, because daughters are a burden on us. SubhanAllah. Yeah, we have to pay so much money to get them married off. They're not going to bring us anything. They're not going to look after us when we're old. They're not going to, you know, all that is going to happen is she's going to be a burden that I pay for my whole life. Mm -hmm. Then I'm going to pay to get her married to somebody. Then she's not going to listen to me after that or look at me after that yeah. because she's going to be with her husband. And it's just going to be a burden upon a burden. This is the kind of thing that happens when you go against the sharia of Allah and the rules of Allah. I'm not saying that every time there's that system, sure. at least to that, but it is very prevalent in countries where women are have to pay a huge amount to get married. Whereas if you look the other way around, first of all, the man is capable of paying, right? He He's the one who's been told to go out and work. So now he also has to value that lady. Yeah? She's worth something to him that, look, at the end of the day, marriage doesn't come for free. Yeah. Or a group of young men, whoever of you has the financial ability, let him get married. So it makes him realize that he has to treat her well and he has to consider her worth something. And it also isn't hard for him, like it's hard for her or her family. And it doesn't, and it puts a value upon, uh, upon having a daughter and raising a daughter that didn't exist in the time of, you know, when you have the other way around, where you have, you know, that the daughter is nothing but a burden for us. Islam honestly came to bring honor to everybody. It didn't come to bring honor to the woman. It came to bring honor to everyone, men and women. And it came to bring good to everybody. But the problem is that we live in a society which is fundamentally going in the wrong direction. Mm. And they're trying to sell you a dream of freedom and happiness, which will lie is just a mirage. It doesn't exist. It's just a lie. And so many of these things come about because they've been told and been sold this dream of freedom and happiness and liberty and whatever. And ultimately, Ibn al-Qayyim, I think he worded it amazing. He said, They ran away from the slavery they were created for. Is that slavery to the man? No, it's not slavery to the man. Slavery to Allah. Mm -hmm. And so they fell into being enslaved by themselves and the shaitan. SubhanAllah. You, you run away from one, you find it in the other. Like now, if you look at these women who are free and liberated, Wallah al they are abused by men at a level that is unbelievable, the amount of abuse, physical abuse, uh, the amount of, uh, you know, uh, relationship abuse, the amount of they're abused for the way they look, they, you know, putting women on billboards and whatever. This is not liberty. This mm. is oppression. This is actually slavery to men but they've dressed it up in the clothing of liberty to make people think that they're liberated and they're free. But liberty and freedom comes when you submit yourself to Allah, yeah. men and women. Yeah. SubhanAllah, very true. Um, when I mentioned Waqarna fi Buyuti Kunna, you did link it to modesty. And I think the rest of the ayah obviously refers to that as well. Yes. Let's talk about that, inshallah. We recently did a podcast, me, myself and Sheikh Abdul Rahman, on the issue of niqab. What, 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 <laughs> what's your opinion on that? You believe niqab is wajib? I do believe that the... That on the balance of evidence that the niqab is uh, an obligation. Yes. Gloves as well? Uh, Allah knows best. I believe, okay. I, I, what I, to the best of my knowledge, that's what I believe to be correct. Yeah. So you believe a woman, <laughs> you can see where this is going, you believe a woman, when she leaves her house, she has to be covered from head to toe. She's just rendered as an anonymous being, almost like an inanimate object just floating around. She's got no personality. People can't see her face. <laughs> you understand why there's some people, especially that's numbers, an incredibly they, misogynistic statement. <laughs> what well, isn't that? The, isn't that's that, incredibly uh, misogynistic. Isn't, isn't that the perception? You're, that no, that's not okay. Go on, carry on. Isn't that the perception that many people have of Islam? It might be the perception, but it's a wholly wrong perception. Okay, why? Why is it wrong? There are two reasons why the hijab was made obligatory upon a woman. First of all, the hijab was not obligatory in the beginning of Islam. This is something that came in the time of Medina, came after a long time in Islam. It was made obligatory for two reasons. So that she can be known, not so she can be, a, what did you say, an anonymous floating object. Anonymous floating object. Yeah, an objects. anonymous floating yeah. object. La, As la, some la, people say. So that she can be known. The hijab is the biggest banner that the woman goes underneath and said, this is me, this is who I am. I'm a person who has boundaries. That's what the hijab means, right? Yeah, hijab yeah, means a, yeah. a boundary, a barrier. Yeah, that this woman, she says, I have boundaries. So you make sure you stay outside of my boundaries, yeah? Make sure I have boundaries. Mm. If you want to go in the house, go in through the front door. Don't climb in through the window. Mm. I, I'm a person who has boundaries. If I'm available to marry, you go speak to my wali. If I'm not, then my husband will see 
what is uh, yani underneath the, 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 this hijab. Everybody else can just keep their boundaries. Mm. And you are off now. So she's making a statement now, like a uniform makes a statement. Like when you see somebody in uniform, it's like, okay, this yeah. person has authority. True. She's making a statement. I have boundaries. I have a hijab. And I have a partition, a barrier. It's between me and between you. You go to the door through the, you go to the house through the door. And it stops her from being harmed. There are many harms here, but ultimately the greatest harm is religious harm. You know, people sometimes make t- talk about the tafsir of the ayah purely, you know, it stops people, uh, you know, whistling at her and it stops people, you know, leering at her. Mm. But ultimately the greatest harm upon her is the harm in her deen. In what way? And the harm in disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or the harm in that hurts her modesty or her chastity. That's the biggest harm, the harm in her religion. So it saves her from the harm in the religion. It saves her from the harm in the dunya. And it sets out a sign that this is who I am. I think it's the biggest statement of her personality. I don't believe it oppresses her personality at all. In fact, let's be honest, how many times in the West, and you know, personally I've seen in office environments, and the way men talk about women mm. because of how they look and, you know, we'll hire her because she's eye candy for the office and, you know, be something to look at. And well, it's devaluing a woman. That's mm. disgusting the way people talk about women like that. And who you value her for who she is or what she looks like. So you put hijab on her. Do you still value her now? Mm. Yeah, very true. You value her for who she is or you value her for what she looks like? Well, I believe that hijab is very, very important. And it's important as well because women are not like men. You know, ultimately, if you take uh, an average of 100 men and you put those 100 men in a line and you have a woman walk past who's not properly clothed and then you take 100 women and you have a man walk past who's not properly clothed wallahi wallahi thumma wallah the reaction will not be the same it's true yeah, it's mustahil impossible for the reaction to be the same men and women are different in that regard but ultimately a woman has a right to be valued for who she is and she has a right to set boundaries and the hijab wallahi sets out a boundary and when I said I do believe the niqab is fucked. But ultimately, I also don't disrespect those people who hold a different view. I understand they have evidence for it and they have uh, they have scholars of Islam who held that opinion. Ultimately, a woman who goes out wearing her hijab to the best of her ability, she sets that boundary. She's known as a practicing Muslim woman who has limits. You treat me with respect. You treat me for who I am. And it stops men from abusing her and it stops her from being harmed in her religion or in her, in her dunya. And I actually believe that's actually... Uh, a positive thing It should be seen as a very positive thing And an empowering thing Because I think right now In the world of feminism Quite sadly yeah. Is that Feminism has actually reduced The choices that women have Like right now In modern feminism today I'm not talking about like First wave feminism But modern feminism today A woman wears hijab She's con- she's oppressed Whether she says she is Or she isn't she says, I'm not oppressed I want to wear the hijab I want to be known As a person of modesty And I want to be judged For who I am Not what I look like No I'm sorry you're oppressed Yeah they feel like Even though she's saying that The only reason she's saying that Is because she's being yeah, Brainwashed by men And you won't be You know You won't be free Until you take off All your clothes hmm. That's the reality Of what yeah. they're saying to her And that's ultimately That it goes against Even the usul of feminism It should go against it Even the fundamentals Of feminism should not should say that a woman has at least they're supposed to say that a woman has a choice, but ultimately they remove the choice in the same way that Islam removes the choice. I do believe that Islam removes the choice, by mm. the way, because Islam is not a religion of choices. It's not for a believing man or a believing woman. If Allah and His Messenger decree a matter, so they should have any choice. Islam is not a religion of choices; it's a religion of submission. But Subhanallah, people calling to freedom. And they remove the choices the same way, yeah. except they remove it for their intention. True. And you know, as for Allah Azawajal, Allah doesn't decree anything for us, men or women, except that it's good for us. Yeah. This issue of protection and protecting the woman, it cannot some may argue make it extremely inconvenient for a woman as well. Like for example, the hadith that says the woman can't travel without a mahram, without mm-hmm. a guardian, so to say, yeah. a male guardian. Can you see why that might be inconvenient for many women, especially now that traveling has been made so easy, yet they can't just easily travel from city to city or far distances? I can see how it could be inconvenient, definitely. Uh, but I believe that everything in Islam has a wisdom, right? We said one of the principles yeah. we started with is hikmatun dalikha. Allah has infinite wisdom. And uh, in cases of necessity, there is a different ruling here. Because okay. the ruling here of a woman not traveling, the Prophet said, لا يحل لمرأة تؤمن بالله واليوم الآخر and you suffer illa wa ma'ha the mahram or kama qal sallallahu alayhi wasallam that it's not permissible for a woman who believes in Allah in the last day to travel without a mahram 
uh, that is a, a, an established ruling in Islam. But necessities have their own rulings, right? So if it's a necessity for her to travel without a mahram, mm. then that's a matter which a necessity is, is not included in any of the rulings of Islam. Necessities, they're in all of the rulings of Islam have exceptions to them because of necessity, right? Mm. Whoever eats from the haram without in a state state of necessity, without going back to it or go or eating more than they need to, there is no sin upon them. So we're not talking about necessities. We're not talking about a woman who, for example, she needs medical treatment and she can't travel because she doesn't have a mahram, so we just leave her to die. Islam doesn't say that. Inconvenience, yes. Mm. But then it, in that regard, inconvenience in return for the pleasure of Allah Azza wa is worth it. And we all do that, men, male and female. We all do things that are uh, that uh, have inconveniences. Like things getting that, out of bed for start of yeah, Fajr, for like example. Like getting out of bed for Fajr or like making wudu in the morning at Fajr time when the water's cold. We go through that because we we know the rewards that exist from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we obey Him. Mm. And ultimately, there's a great wisdom. And I honestly believe that a woman traveling alone, uh, there may be situations in which a woman can travel alone and not be harmed. But a lot of the time, if we say that, remember we said the ruling, uh, Sharia looks at al-ghalib, al-sha'i, not al-nadir. It looks at that which is most of the time and commonplace. And I would suggest that most of the time, a woman who is traveling on her own, if you look at history and you look at even the world today, in most countries, you look at a woman just on her own, that like that traveling, like a backpacker, she's just walking around this, you know, a city by herself. Yeah. There's a lot of danger in that. Yeah, potentially. More than with a man. But a potentially. And that's the ghalib. No, no, yeah. I think that's the ghalib. That's no, but the I'm, not, I'm not sure that that's valid because nowadays you get on flights and you're not alone. You're with other people. But we're, Islam is flights. saying you can't even get on a flight even without your husband. Even on no, flights. No, I'm not sure that's the case. Even as on as flights, the majority I of women, as there's many, many non Muslim women who would travel around on a flight from one country to another country. They're not and I believe no, and I believe that there's a lot of un-Islamic things happen in that situation. Mm. A lot of exposure to things which true. are not Islamic in that situation. True, true, that is true. And I again, you know, at the end of the day, Islam doesn't say that. that in fact, there are a hadith that indicate that a woman can make, that there will come a time when a woman can travel in safety. But that doesn't change the ruling of Islam, because there are harms there, whether you perceive them or not. And to be honest, I think even you, even on flights. And I, I travel a lot, I take okay. a lot of flights. And honestly, you can see when women are traveling by themselves in many situations, not every situation, I'm not, I don't need to prove every situation. I only need to prove that this is commonplace. Yeah. That things happen that shouldn't. Okay, I'm coming towards the end of the questions that I have for you. I want to move on to the, on the discussion to inheritance. And again, this is something that's very well known in Islam that uh, a, a daughter, inherits half of what her brothers inherit. This obviously if the parents pass away. How is that fair? I think uh, I would like to stop first of all on that particular statement that a daughter inherits half of what the sons inherit if the parents pass away. I think it's really important that there are many situations in inheritance where that's not the case. Okay. Um, I Although I'll start by saying yes, I the general rule that that is the majority of cases, it would be the case that a male at the same level, for example, a child, uh, a male would inherit twice that of a female. Okay. So let's answer that first. Yeah, because but you've I been saying all the way through the podcast that the, the sharia comes for yeah. the ghalib and, the, you know. Yeah, absolutely. But I want to talk about some situations in which that's not the case so that people don't take it as a qaida, which is absolute. It's not okay. absolute. In fact, there are situations where a woman inherits more than a man. But let's just take, for example, this, this, this situation where you have a man who passes away and he left behind sons and daughters, a mixture. Okay. The son takes double that which the daughter takes. Mm -hmm. First of all, we have to understand from this that this is actually a very, this, it's actually a very simple situation to understand. Typically, boys, the son in this case, will have spending obligations. He will have to spend upon his sister. He will have to spend upon his wife, if he has one. He'll have to spend upon his mother, if she's still alive. He will have to spend upon, typically, that's going to be his role. Yeah. As for that woman, that money she receives, nobody she has to spend it on at all. 
No one. Except in some situations, if her parents are really poor and there is no one to spend on them except her and she's wealthy, that's a different matter. But typically, that money is hers. Okay. Handbags and shoes. <laughs> she can, you know, like at the end of the day, she if, she if that's what she wants to spend it on, that's what she can spend it on. She doesn't have to spend it upon anybody. But typically, that boy would have to spend it even upon, even if we say no one was left except just that brother and sister. That boy may well be obliged to spend to mm. look after his true. sister. Yeah, true. But that sister, she doesn't have to spend yeah. upon him. So that's one reason. Okay. But it's actually a misconception that it's a, it's a universal rule that, that men receive double what women receive in inheritance. Sometimes men and women receive the same. So let's take, for example, a person who dies and leaves behind a sister yeah. on their mother's side okay. and a brother on their mother's side. They inherit equally. Half and half, 50-50. The sister on the mother's side and a brother on the mother's side. Okay. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَإِن كَانَ رَجُلٌ يُورَثُ كَلَالَةً أَوْ إِمْرَأَةٌ وَلَهُ أَخٌ أَوْ أُخْتٌ فَلِكُلِّ وَاحِدٍ مِّنْهُمَ السُّدُسٌ He said, if there is a man who dies without any children or a woman, and they have a brother or sister on the mother's side, every one of them, whether male or female, inherits a sixth. What do you mean by brother and sister on the mother's side? So this is, um, um, we think of from the dead person here. So okay. Abdullah dies yep. and Abdullah has a half brother and sister. Uh. The half brother and sister are half from his mom's side. In other words, that his mom was previously married okay. or subsequently yeah, married. Yeah. And he has a half brother and a half sister. They inherit equally 50-50 okay. dead, right. you know, like a sudos, a sixth and a sixth. Um, or if they are more than that, then they share a third yani equally among themselves. Okay. The male and the female do not get different amounts. So that's an example when they inherit the same. They may inherit more. So for example, let's take a, a woman dies leaving behind her husband and two daughters. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. The husband inherits a quarter and the daughters inherit a third each. Oh, wow. So now the daughters inherited more even each individual daughter inherited more than their father inherited from their mother who from their mother who passed mm -hmm. away and there are some situations uh, like that for example uh, a husband a wife dies leaving behind a husband and leaving behind a single daughter the husband takes a quarter she takes a half the daughter and she inherits the remaining as well uh, yeah, she inherits what remains from it. There are some situations even in which a woman inherits and a man doesn't inherit anything. So let's take, for example, a woman who dies. She leaves behind a husband mm -hmm. and she leaves behind a father, a mother, a daughter, and a granddaughter from her son. Okay. A granddaughter from her son. If it was a grandson from her son, he wouldn't inherit anything. Huh. But the granddaughter from her son inherits a sixth. Okay. So if it was her brother, he wouldn't inherit anything. The reason he wouldn't inherit anything is what he has left is al-baqi, whatever's left. And there's nothing left in that in that situation. There's nothing left for him. Right, because it's all be, each share has been given out to other people. And she takes a share, a fixed share of a sixth. But if it was the case that she had a brother, the brother gets nothing because there is nothing left for him. Yeah. So yes, these are not like... It's not the most common situation. Sure, sure. But there are situations. It's not that Islam didn't set a principle. Women, you don't deserve anything. Men, you deserve more. Rather, that each situation is set out by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are times when a woman uh, gets equal. There are times when she gets more. There are times when she inherits and the man inherits nothing. But the general principle is that when it comes to, for example, children on the same level, or when it comes to brothers and sisters on the father's side, or full brothers and sisters, generally speaking, it goes in the level that the man will take double that which the woman takes, but the, her wealth belongs to her alone. Correct, yeah. And the man typically has obligations to spend out of uh, his wealth. And that's just me finding, a, I mean, not me, but the scholars of Islam mention it as from among the wisdoms you can take. But ultimately, we have to submit to Allah when we understand that Allah knows best for us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to oppress anybody among us. He's not oppress any woman among us, any man among us. Allah Azza wa knows best. And that's more important even than the reason I just gave, which yeah. is just to say that, you know, typically, for example, a man has spending obligations that he has to spend upon women, but the woman doesn't have to spend upon anyone. 
That's fair enough, but that's only one example. Really, the ultimate example is yeah. the one who created you knows better what to give you and what not to give you. Yeah, and I think that's something that, like I, I reiterate, like I said before, that's a constant theme that has come up time and time again over this podcast. We've mentioned some very controversial issues. And of course, the number one reason why we submit that is because this is what Allah has said. Having said that, within each and every single one of them, you've brought about from yourself and from scholars before you, wisdoms that we can understand as human beings, let alone the hikmah and the wisdom that is with Allah that we're not even aware of. I think that's an important, important point to bring out that every single ruling within the religion of Islam that we've discussed today, there's not been a single one where I don't think we've actually, I don't think you've actually sat opposite me and said, just accept it, just accept it. You've always brought about wisdoms, even though as Muslims, we should be accepting it anyway, as you established yeah, in the start. Yeah, because we have to understand that whatever wisdoms we bring are, are just our limited yeah. ability to, to see the wisdom in certain things. But actually the wisdom is far greater than that. Yeah. You know, we mentioned, for example, a woman uh, remaining in a house. And, you know, some of the scholars mentioned, for example, waqarna, the word used is the word qarar. And the word qarar, it means to find, to be settled there. That's where she's going to be settled and where she's comfortable and based around. And, you know, there are, there are so many wisdoms that are mentioned. But the yeah. point is that ultimately... We need to have that trust in Allah that those wisdoms are there, that Allah doesn't legislate dhulm for anyone and Allah doesn't legislate hardship. You know, even this word uh, taklif, mm. you know, this word al-mukallaf. They say that burdened, burdened, yeah. You know, Allah hasn't burdened you with anything. لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. Allah has honored you with Islam. Mm. Allah has given you gifts. Allah has blessed you. Allah hasn't burdened anyone with anything. But these examples are just to show that there are wisdom. So people watch and say, okay, yeah, I can see some of the wisdom in that. But actually the wisdom in it is far greater than, than even what any human being can can express or can explain. Yeah. I have one more question for you before we move on to some of the okay. closing questions. And this is to do with actually a topic that is not normally associated with Islam. And that's the topic of superstition. Mm. And there's a hadith I have here in Sahih al-Bukhari where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, evil omen is in the woman, the house, and the horse. How do you explain that? Mm. That a shu'um is found in three things. I think that, first of all, it's really, what you said in the beginning is actually very important, that superstition has no place in Islam. Mm. So whatever this hadith means, for certain this hadith is not True. superstition. Yeah. But a shu'um is where you can feel that something is not right for you. Okay. It's just, this is not, it's not meant for me. And the Prophet mentioned three things. He mentioned al mar'ah, mm -hmm. a woman, like, as in your wife. Dabba, uh, a, a riding beast, and a bait, a house. Islam doesn't oppress houses. I think we all <laughs> agree unanimously yeah. that Islam is not a religion that oppresses houses or oppresses horses or camels. So there's no reason to consider this oppressed as a woman. It simply means that when you, you know, you have that feeling, a shu'am is like that. Like you have a feeling that it's just, this does, isn't me, it isn't meant for me. This doesn't work for me. There are some houses, there's no reason someone says, explain why. Just, yeah, it's not, can't put it's not, on it. just not, I can't put my, it's not working for me. It's not something that is right for me. Now, Islam didn't approve any kind of superstition, that this person's superstitious or they're a, a curse upon me or an evil omen upon me. I think the translator there uh, tried to find a good word for a shu'um, which is difficult to bring in. But this feeling that something just, to be honest, this person is just not bringing good for me. You know, since I married, it's just not worked out for me one way or the other. Mm. That is correct to say about a, a woman about your wife that it could be a case that someone got married and it just doesn't suit them and they can't necessarily put their finger on it or they can't really uh, necessarily express it in words it's just not working out for me and the same thing can happen with a, a riding beast that this riding beast since every time I've ridden it something has gone wrong like it just didn't work out for me and I'm not saying it's a superstitious or it's got it's right. cursed or something right. I'm just saying that it just has not worked out for me properly at all. And likewise, a person can say so about a house. You see, you know what it is? I just decide I'm gonna move. Why are you gonna move your house in a nice area? And if, okay, it just, it, yes. it's not for me. This thing is not for me. So that is one understanding of the hadith. But for sure, what we can say is there's absolutely no chance of 
superstition in Islam because that goes against the, that goes against Tawheed, which is the essence of Islam. Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to move on to some closing questions now before I give okay. you a chance to summarize what we've discussed so far. Um, I was wondering when you're going to ask me about the things that uh, women have been given that men haven't. Been yeah, given. that's not for this podcast. That's definitely not. We're for not going to talk about no, gold, wearing gold and <laughs> silk and you know the the ease that's been given to the women in some of that. No, that door is closed. That door, that door is okay. definitely closed. That's <laughs> not for discussion here. Okay. Never mind. Okay. Um, what if someone listens to this and they've heard what you have to say and they agree with what you have to say? However, they say that there is no doubt that the religion of Islam nowadays, as it is practiced, let's just say culturally in parts of the world is oppressing women and therefore what about the solution of actually changing some of the texts some of the religious texts to make sure that these kind of things aren't abused what, what, what are your kind of thoughts on that okay the problem with that is, is there are three real huge problems I think the first thing is that Allah sent down this religion knowing what would happen until the end of time hmm. Today I've completed my favor upon you, completed your religion for you, chosen my favor upon you, completed for your Islam, chosen for you. Islam is your religion. Islam is your religion now. Whatever was religion on that day, like Imam Malik said, so whatever was not religion on that day is not religion today. Yeah. Our religion doesn't have that flexibility. The second thing is once you open the door to that, you also open the door for people who want to abuse women to revise the texts. Mm. You have opened the door for a man to say, what well, the ribu means beat them black and blue. Right. Because you're now opening the door to revision of the text according to what you feel. And like the ulama say, al tatafawat. The intellects go are different of different levels. Some people they might recommend something that they see to be good, but another person sees it to be bad. Yeah. Or it has negative side effects. So it's this idea of allowing people to revise the text. And the third thing is it's just not necessary. Because all that is necessary is going back to the Islam of the Prophet Sallallahu It's not Islam that's at fault. It's not practicing Islam that's at fault. And actually, if you look at that, you actually see that the question itself provides the answer. That there are people not practicing Islam mm. properly, so let's revise Islam. Right. Actually, there are not people not practicing Islam properly, so let's start practicing yeah. Islam properly. They are the ones who revised Islam and oppressed their women. Mm. Treat your women well. The Prophet ﷺ told us that you've taken them as an amana from Allah, as a as a responsibility from Allah. It's a severe thing. It's a mithaq, which is ghalid. Allah described it in the Quran as a heavy oath, a heavy burden. This is what Islam said. So what we need to do is go back to Islam and we need to get rid of every attempt to change and revise and modify Islam. Now, someone might say, and it's really important to note, that Islam does provide flexibility in the form of qawaid and yeah. usul. What we mean by that is that there are principles and a framework which is from Islam revealed by Allah which gives us flexibility in certain things. That flexibility is built into Islam. You don't need to add it or revise it or change it. It's actually an original part of Islam and it only exists in certain things where Allah has given you that right, flexibility. Right. That is there, that's how someone says, well, how can Islam survive until now? Because there are qawaid and usul principles, foundations, and a framework which allows you to deal with new situations, new circumstances, and so on, in the light of what Allah revealed, and not according to people's uqul. Because the feminist, for example, wants it revised one way, and let's say, for example, someone who is a misogynist, for example, wants to revise it a different way. And ultimately, we don't want either of them to revise it. We want it to be like it was revealed uh, from the Lord of the Worlds. You know, you mentioned throughout this podcast, the feminism and feminists. Like, what are your general thoughts on this kind of feminism movement that's been taking place? I think that when I looked at feminism, and I don't claim to be an expert on feminism, I don't think that's fair. I think my job here is to is to present what Islam, what I know of of, of Islam, uh, and so I would say, you know, I would definitely put that disclaimer out there. But from what I have understood about feminism, is that feminism gathers together lots of different movements and lots of different uh, ideologies and lots of different of different severity within that and different perspectives and different levels of extremism and extremity. Right. to be honest, are gathered all in together. There are certain things that feminists 
wanted to achieve at some point, be it first wave feminism or second wave feminism, that Islam already gave them in the beginning. And so what we say is that feminism there was not really the answer, but the answer again was actually Islam. Islam already gave, you know, for example, you have some situations where a woman is effectively treat, treated like, like property, you know, like she's basically uh, inherited and, you know, that she is considered to be uh, a slave to her husband and things like that. Islam already gave women those rights. So the right to break out of that was given to them by Islam. They don't need a movement to do that. And there are a lot of things in there that are not part, that are not compatible with Islam, in all honesty. And there are some things in there that reach such an extreme that they even break the rules that feminism was built upon. You know, this all this, these issues now, that this modern agenda, which takes the choice of a woman away, yeah. the choice to, to cover be a woman, it, yeah. you know, uh, the yeah, choice yeah. to be just a woman, yeah. you know? No, no, you're not allowed to be a woman. You have to be a man. Until you be, a, until you be, until you are a man, you cannot, you know, you cannot be a feminist. You can, that's that really, in reality, is taking far, far away from what's going to bring a woman happiness. And ultimately, men and women, our happiness is in servitude. As soon as you leave servitude to Allah, you end up with servitude to creation, and that inevitably is usually going to end up with a woman in servitude to a man. Because at the end of the day, that's how society yeah. has, has worked for the longest time. When you have servitude to Allah, that's the only way to break out from that. Yeah. Because that woman says, look, you know, I might be obeying you in what is good. But the minute you tell me to do something that Allah is not happy with, no, I'm sorry. My servitude is to Allah, not to you. Hmm. And that's ultimately what's going to bring men and women happiness. And people will search for happiness in other things. But Allah, ultimately, they realize that they don't find that happiness except in servitude to Allah. And that's what we're calling to. We're not calling to women serving men, but we're calling to men and women being servants of Allah and living the way that Allah has organized your life. However that is, with the flexibility that's in there, but living in within the framework that Allah which has sent down for organizing and structuring our lives. And ultimately, you know, that might mean that one is in charge and one isn't, but at the end of the day, it Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you the opportunity to get near to him and the opportunity for reward. So I personally see that there are, I wouldn't discount every single goal of feminism, right. but I would just simply say like every ism, you know, it has to be just taken and compared to the book and the sunnah. Yeah. And what you find is that the vast majority of things in there are un incompatible with the Quran and the sunnah. And you actually find now when we talk about, you know, whether we're into a fourth wave, new wave, latest version of feminism mm. 4.0, mm. ultimately you find things that are, you know, we talk about all this issue of pressure on people to change their gender and, uh, you know, all this kind of stuff that's going on. Well, it's, it's gone to a level that if the first wave feminists saw it, well, they would declare themselves free from it. Well, they would say, we are, we, are, we are free from this. We have nothing to do with it. But in the beginning, there may have been certain objectives which were, which, push them towards that movement, which were actually given to them by Islam. But right. the answer to that is not feminism. The answer to that is actually Islam. Because whenever you make a system for yourself to achieve something, you actually realize that system falls short of what Allah already gave you. Final question for me before you have your chance to summarize the discussion. What would your advice be to a Muslim sister who wants to be a practicing Muslim sister? And she's watched this discussion, but she's living in a time and a place where that is telling her that you're being oppressed, you're being oppressed. And she really wants to be a practicing Muslim. What would your advice be to someone like that? My advice, honestly, would be to focus on Allah. You know, at the end of the day, for you to, to make your relationship with Allah right, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make your relationship with everybody else right. And ultimately, if you seek to please Allah, Allah will make people pleased with you. And if you displease Allah, the people will never be happy with you. Whatever you do for them, they'll never they'll never be satisfied. So I would say the goal of that sister is not like we say we don't start by saying, okay, you know, you need to look at your husband and you need to look at your father and you need to be. No, we say the first thing you need to do is build your relationship with Allah and make that your only priority. And ultimately, that's true for men and women because we all go through things. I remember when I first accepted Islam, there was a lot of pressure to do things that were not in line with Islam. And until now, many men are under pressure mm. to do things that are not in line with Islam. Yeah. But ultimately we turn around and say, 
my goal here is to make Allah pleased. My goal is not to make people pleased. And that's why even in this, you know, in these answers I've given, I haven't aimed to please people. You know, I'm not making this video so that people watch it and they think, oh, wow, you know, I'm really pleased. I can make it, I can make it sound really sweet. You know, I can sweeten it. Hmm. We can put a bit of honey on top and it can become like, you know, such a, you know, everything can be just sweetened for people. But really what we want to do is we want to make Allah happy. I want to make Allah pleased with us. And if Allah is pleased with us, people, well, uh, if, there's, if there's good in them, they will be pleased. Yeah. And ultimately, when you live like that, you feel real freedom. Mm. You actually feel yeah, like, true. now I'm free because I don't care what anybody thinks of me. On this face of this earth, I don't care what anybody thinks of me. If Allah is happy with me, if Allah is pleased with me, that's all I want. And I would say to people, really simple, just go back. Allahu amaraka bihada. Did Allah command you to do this? Even la yudayyana. Allah is not going to let us go. Yeah. Allah is not going to make us lost. If Allah commanded, if there is something that your husband is telling you to do, that Allah ma anzal Allahu biha min sultan, you have every right to say Allah didn't send down any authority. You have every right to say, I'm sorry, I, I, you know, I'm not willing to do that. But if it's Allah that commanded you to do something, Allah is not going to cause you to be lost. Look at this statement of who? Of a man or a woman? A woman. Hajar. Yeah, so so she so said, Allahu amaraka bihada. Allah told you to leave me here or not? Or was it your idea? <laughs> <laughs> Naam, Allah told me to leave you here. Allah is not going to make us get lost. Allah is not going to cause us to become lost. He is not going to leave any man or any woman who does righteous deeds. He is not going to cause anything they do to be lost. Jazakallah khairan. I really appreciate your time today. Barakallah feek. Would you like to summarize what we've discussed? Well, I think we've, we've covered a lot of the points. Uh, I think it's really, really important. Again, we go back to the idea of uh, servitude to Allah Azza wa Jal. We go back to the idea that you have unlimited opportunities in front of you. Men and women, you have so many opportunities. Wallah, when you waste your time, both men and women, and I don't mean just women, men and women, you waste your time coveting what other people have, looking for what someone else has. Why can't I be the one sat in that chair? Why can't I be the one doing this? Why can't I be the one? Allah, you just you lose the opportunities that are in front mm -hmm. of you. So take them, make sure you learn your religion properly because that's the only way you're going to know. First of all, for men, you're not going to know how to treat a woman right unless you know your religion. For women, you're not going to know what it means to be treated correctly yeah. unless you know your sure. religion. Let's go back to how the religion used to be in the beginning because that's what brought honor. And if you look at role models like our mother Aisha radiallahu anha, uh, you look at the mothers of the believers, you look at the daughters of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam radiallahu anhun. You look at the Sahabiyat, you see every kind of success, every kind of, of, of goodness, every kind of, you know, achievement in this world. There is so much that every Muslim woman can do. But Wallah, she just doesn't need to waste her time sitting there listening to the, you know, the, the statements of people who don't want good for her. Mm -hmm. Wallah, if they wanted good for her, you look at them and say, okay, after she takes this feminism and she becomes a feminist, and she leaves all the religion that Allah Azza wa Jalla sent, then what do you want from her? What you want from her is kul suwa makruh. Everything evil and everything that's disgusting. That's what you want. Because ultimately that's what it's based upon. Yeah. Is, and freedom and uh, it comes from worshipping Allah Azza wa Jal. Uh, there are so many things. Islam gives roles to everyone. And ultimately Allah gives you the best set of opportunities for you. And sometimes I think that people want things that are harder than the things they have. You know, if a, a woman is being given, for example, if someone said to you, Shahid, look, if you pray five times a day, you fast the month of Ramadan, you obey, let's say, for example, the Wali al Amr, eight doors of Jannah open for you. <laughs> you say, well, I don't want it. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I don't, <laughs> I don't want the eight doors of Jannah. I want to go out and work. <laughs> La wallah. Yeah, and like, so if true. Allah has given you something, take what Allah has given you. Take it with both hands. Khudil kitab bi Take the scripture with strength and go and take every opportunity that Allah has given you. And you'll still find within Islam so much flexibility, so much flexibility that will allow you still to be your own self, to have your, you know, to do the things that you want. You'll find that within, uh, yeah, within Islam, inshallah ta'ala. I think otherwise, I would just say the points that we made at the beginning, those were the most important yeah. points uh, to go back to. But I think we've covered a lot and it's been a, it's been a good session, alhamdulillah. It was nice to come back. Barakallah feek. Inshallah, we'll see you again soon. Inshallah. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashhadu wa la ilaha ant astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk.